Which city was number seven? Uh, good evening to all in attendance. Um, we're going to wait maybe about two more minutes uh, to allow attendees and members of the committee to show up, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Unmute. Should I mute? Just wait about one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, Marissa. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome all uh, to the March cycle meeting of Manhattan Community Board 5's Transportation and Environment Committee. Um, I'm the chair, uh, EJ Kalifarski. Uh, welcome, we've got two items on our agenda tonight. Uh, one, uh, that's a discussion um, that we're initiating ourselves um, and that we might, uh, and that uh, we plan to um, uh, hear some presentations and from some members of the public on, but we, um, I'm going to call a little bit of an audible uh, and do our second item first because I anticipate it uh, being pretty short and um, and straightforward. Our uh, first item of the evening is a, a revocable consent application um, for, let me pull up the address here, uh, 16 East 16th Street. An application from uh, Gramercy Park House LLC for revocable consent to restore entry portals at um, sidewalk entrance. Uh, what we'll do is um, uh, we'll hear from some members of the committee who have uh, 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 been in contact with the applicant. We'll hear from the applicant themselves. Um, after that point, we'll, uh, there'll be an opportunity for any members of the public to uh, First, members of the committee will be able to ask questions to the applicant if they want, It'll be an opportunity for members of the public to comment, and then the committee will discuss what, if any, action to take um, this evening. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to go right into this first item of the evening. Um, Noah and Nancy, do you have some context that you're able to provide for this application? Yes, sure. Um, Nancy, do you want to start or, or should I? Um, no, go ahead, Noah. You, you've done more of the work on this than I have. Okay, sure. Um, so this site is on the south side of um, 16th Street between 5th Avenue and uh, Union Square West. Um, it has been under scaffolding, I think, for more of the course of, I think, um, 18 months. Uh, I could be, be wrong on that, but I think 
gener I, I think it's uh, been um, under scaffolding for around uh, a year and um, and a half, and they um, demolished the the current building that was there, and they are building a um, hotel. I I, I think, um, and what this what what they're trying to to do um, today is get a per, um, to uh, restore the two sidewalk portals. Um, currently, there is a like step up, and they they want to bring those down. Uh, to the sidewalk level. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of the, the uh, general context. Thanks, Noah. Um, anything else to add or should we uh, uh, jump into the applicants' um, uh, comments? Um, Nancy, if you have anything else. Okay. I'm um, good. Let's hear what they have to say. It sounds good. Is the applicant here? Hi, I'm Todd Poisson. I'm a partner at BKSK Architects. I'm the applicant's architect. Hi. I'll be representing Trevor Stolhusky. He's going to join us, I think, shortly. But I'm happy to share my screen and quickly show you a very short presentation about what uh, Noah just described. Great. That sound OK? Um, like Noah said, um, or contrary, a little contrary to what Noah said, we didn't. Dem we're not demolishing the building. It is a landmark property. Uh, we're demolished the building behind the historic facade. So just to clarify, the historic facade is staying uh, in place, and we have landmarks approval for everything that you are about to see, um, including the rooftop addition there. That is not part of tonight's conversation, but uh, the application to landmarks included uh, the rooftop extension, uh, recalling a. 19th century, the original architect's 19th century wish for a gabled roof, and we're kind of interpreting his 19th century design in a modern contemporary screen. But in the meantime, on the ground floor, we hope to restore, uh, like Noah said, the um, two entry portals and the whole ground floor for that matter, the ground floor facade. Um, so looking back in history, the original uh, late 1800s ground floor looked like it appears on the upper left. This is a historic photograph, uh, brownstone and sandstone and granite ground floor with steps up to two entrances on, on the east and west part of the site. The, the building is 50 feet wide on the south side of uh, 16th Street. There are some existing historic columns at the sixth floor that we think were um, identical or, or quite close to what was on the ground floor. So we're using those as precedents to model our restoration of the ground floor after. There's also some other historic photos that you see on the bottom here that we've kind of zoomed in on and done our best to analyze with different software to re, uh, reenact the, the ground floor, uh, complete with the cheek walls at the two entrances. We're not gonna come out as far out onto the sidewalk as they did historically. Um, they, they came out about five feet um, before because there was a stair landing and several steps. As Noah mentioned, we are, applying, we are um, uh, lowering the ground floor for handicap access. So we don't need those cheek walls to come out as far. We're only coming out three foot six, uh, but we're going to uh, recreate the portals and the, the, the smaller version of the cheek walls and the ornamental lamps. Uh, the gargoyles we hope to capture as well. We have restoration specialists um, from AJLB, Surface Design Group, and we're working with quarries in Canada to source the right sandstone uh, to match. Uh, the existing condition of the building is seen now here on the screen. It was the Sydney um, um, Hellman Health Center for many years. Um, they put this facade in in the 1950s, and they are projecting onto the sidewalk the existing condition or the pre-existing condition was this um, concrete in, uh, concrete ramp that came out four feet 10 from the street wall on, encroaching on the sidewalk, as well as the steps to the right. Both are concrete with painted steel uh, railings. So our restoration is just really quite straightforward uh, using the historic photographs and documents to recreate this as faithfully as possible. Um, bringing the ground floor down to the sidewalk is really the only uh, substantive change from the historic con uh, condition and the slightly smaller um, cheek walls. 
we're gonna we're proposing granite as the base instead of sandstones for a more um, a long lasting heavy duty base where the building hits the ground. And you could also see some, uh, you know, the building appurtenances like the, the gas room vent and the Siamese connection in the middle, um, the various things like that that will be installed in the ground floor that weren't there originally. Uh, there will also be two street trees. Uh, that's the only difference with this drawing is to just illustrate the uh, ground floor restoration with the street trees. And then I think this is the last page. Um, just a straightforward elevation drawing showing the portals, um, sandstone uh, quarried from, we hope to quarry it from, we have two quarries in Canada that we're looking at, the original quarry in Portland, Connecticut closed, um, that the original sandstone was from, but we found two quarries in Canada that, that, that are producing the same, almost exactly the same sandstone. So we're really excited about restoring this ground floor facade for your community board on 16th Street. And that's all. Um, okay, thanks, Todd, for that presentation. Uh, I'll um, I'll uh, give some opportunity for um, folks on the committee to ask questions. Um, I'll just say a couple things um, uh, in context first, and and I have a question myself. Um, so the reason uh, why a revocable consent is required for this is um, because of the three and a half foot uh, outcropping into the sidewalk space, is that correct? Correct. Okay, and even though that was a prior condition of the building, because it's been um, so long, the, a revocable, con revocable consent is now required to restore that and use the, you know, the sidewalk space that has been vacant for the last 60 or 70 years um, for that purpose? Is that, can, well, I imagine, can you explain a little bit more about why it, why why the oh, permit is needed? Sure, well, I imagine that the, the health center has one in place. Uh, I And I think, yeah, we looked into, um, so this ramp and the steps occupy uh, the sidewalk, um, a lot more of the sidewalk actually than we're uh, proposing to. This ramp projects onto the sidewalk, um, almost five feet and the, or uh, yeah, five feet. And so does the steps um, and they do have a revocable consent on file. Uh, you can't, um, uh, we, we looked into amending their existing revocable consent with the new design, uh, but DOT said, no, let's start over. Okay, um, thank you. For the, for the context of the committee, um, uh, this and and you know the applicant correct, can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this uh, I believe came to um, our landmarks committee and and thus our full board in December of 2019, uh, probably prior to going to LPC and um, and that's uh, uh, probably around when uh, LPC granted approval for this project as as you were referring to, right, Todd? Correct. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't remember the exact date, uh, but yes, that is the application. It's the same. Um, for the ground floor, it was the same application that you saw for the landmarks subcommittee. Okay. Yep. Thanks. For the for the committee's awareness, um, you know, it, it does appear that the that all of this came before our landmarks committee. At the time, our landmarks committee um, uh, and and the full board. Um, uh, appeared to not agree that um, that the uh, work that was being proposed on the building was was harmonious um, and and at that time the community board voted to um, to deny that application obviously LPC went ahead and approved it anyway that's not you know the elements such as the historicalness and the um, materials and the overall design of the facade are not what is before us tonight. What's before us tonight is the uh, revocable consent to use that sidewalk space for um, this purpose, for the entryways, as I understand right. it. Right, maybe AJ just uh, um, uh, said a little light on that. The debate for, in the community board landmark subcommittee um, back then really focused on the rooftop addition. Um, 
the, the as you as you can imagine, the the conversation was quite different about the ground floor, you know, faithful restoration versus a uh, the the uh, rooftop addition that we were interpreting history. But yes, okay. uh, landmarks did uh, subsequently approve this version that you saw you see on the screen now. Um, yes, the, the version that your subcommittee saw for the rooftop was uh, a metal screen, so that was also kind of fundamentally different. I see. Up, okay. Up on, up Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to members of the committee. Um, uh, if you have any questions uh, for the applicant, uh, members of the committee, go ahead and use the raise hand feature. Uh, Noah, go ahead. Sure. So I think Trevor said that the project would be finished by uh, October 2023. I just want to make sure that that, that date is correct. Um, actually, Trevor is just that. Can there you hear is. me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I was having trouble connecting before, but the, uh, yeah, the project schedule has a uh, Q4, you know, fourth quarter, October mm -hmm. slash November 2023 uh, completion date at this point. Okay, thank you. I mean, we all know, we all know that supply chains and, you know, post-COVID mm -hmm. uh, construction world is, is, is challenged to say the least, but, um, you know, we have a contractor on board to build it. We're demolishing the building and we have a project schedule that shows project completion in fourth quarter of 23. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up is Sarah Dowson. Um, hi, Todd, you had mentioned that, uh, and this isn't for the sidewalk or the doors, but you had mentioned the facade of the building is mostly sandstone, but you also mentioned that you were putting granite in. Where is the granite? So the the, uh, the granite is I will highlight it here uh, the base where the building hits the ground we we wanted where to um, upgrade okay. you know we didn't want to put sandstone uh, touching the the salt and 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 etc down at the ground so this area is the granite great thank you you're welcome thanks uh, Nancy um. Uh, signage. The only signage is uh, what you're showing here, right now. That's, yeah, that's, Nothing. that's correct. That that's correct. Land, Landmarks has had their um, look at this as well, and obviously a concern of theirs. But we 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 plan to have a you know a very bespoke, um, small, minimal signage. And where it says the word hotel, that's just because at the name at the time we didn't have the exact name of the hotel trademarked. Okay, um, the lighting is the only uh, four tor torches. Is that correct on the si on the cheek walls? Is that the only well, lighting that? Well, I mean, uh, per per this rendering, the four lights you see on the cheek walls is what we're talking about for street level. We do we correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, but we we do have some discussions going on with landmarks of of other potential very small <laughs> accent lighting on the facade. Yes, correct. There, uh, we did show landmarks, kind of a master plan, Nancy, of 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 lighting the facade, and it did include a, a few kind of discrete lights in the portals, like up lighting um, from like LED, kind of LED up lighting. Nothing like massively dramatic by by any stretch. Okay. Uh, um, in terms of um, what we're interested in is encroachment onto the sidewalk. So. Um, are there any sidewalk vents that are not showing? No. In this, uh, well, nothing. I think Todd, Todd pointed out there was a, a, the Siamese connections. Yeah, the Siamese, um, there, there's per, uh, various things that are um, attached to the facade, but Nancy is, is uh, it's a good question because there is, Trevor, there is a, a fuel, there will be a fuel um, fill right here. Uh, if you, everyone saw that circle that I just drew on the lower left and near the lower left cheek wall there, there's a uh, the generator fuel fill uh, manhole cover will be there. So how far out do they protrude? I mean, is it minimal 10 inches, uh, two feet, one foot? What can you give me an idea of? Yes, I could show you the actual. Uh, uh, just give me the uh, dimensions. I, I just want to put it a, in my write up. It's a, a 24 inch diameter. No, uh, how far does it protrude uh, beyond the, the line of the facade? The fuel, uh, fuel, the fuel fill, or the the Siamese. Any, what it, what is the most fur, What is uh, the furthest of all of those? Uh, we're okay. we're interested in. I know so, that the cheek walls uh, encroach, but I'm wondering if there's anything else. 
Yeah. So I um, that, that that protrudes. Sure. So on, on this on the screen now is the uh, that manhole cover the uh, the circle here. So it's a two foot diameter, um, and it's so about two foot six to okay. the um, outward part. Okay. Good. Um, and the Siamese connection is minimal, right? That's not much, right? Correct. For that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the right. usual connections. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, 10, 12 the, inches. Okay. 10 to 12 inches. Okay. Oh, inches. All right. Um, next question. Um, what is the clear distance between the uh, edge of the cheek walls and the tree pits? The fat, in other words, the, the, Cheek walls protrude out oh, uh -huh. three, yes. feet, three feet, six inches, right? Correct. Yes. And then okay. there will be uh, six foot, six inches between the cheek, the outer, outermost, the, the closest cheek wall of uh, leading edge to the tree pit. Okay. So, so, okay. So that's a concern. Um, and the, I guess the overall size of the tree pits are what? Uh, the five by 10, the DOT okay. standard. Five by ten. Okay. Um, did, has DOT reviewed this at all? Yes. Um, and they weren't concerned about the six foot six inch distance between the tree pit and the edge of the protruding cheek walls. No, not that I know. That's, no. that's normally eight should be eight feet clearance. So I was they wondering have, they if they made not, a comment. Yeah, they have not made any comments to it. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe the, the cheek wall isn't exactly parallel to it, but it's close to that. You know, it's the cheek wall is like here. It's a little, so it's probably a little more than six foot six, maybe seven foot, but I, I hear you. It's a, it's a little it's not eight. It's not eight feet. So it's that's not eight feet. Yep. Okay. All right. Those were my questions. Yep. Look, we have more, we have more, much more flexibility on a tree pit than we do the cheek wall. The cheek wall is, you know, historic fabric, The tree pits, something we would like to do, but. If DOT says it doesn't work, we just don't do a tree pit. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ask Colleen, uh, who's our um, uh, local uh, DOT representative. Colleen, do you, are, you, are you aware of this or any concern about the, the six and a half um, uh, the six and a half feet where it would otherwise be eight feet? Do you know anything about um, whether DOT would be concerned? Colleen, can you hear me? You can unmute yourself. You've been promoted to panelists. All right, maybe we don't have Colleen right now. <laughs> um, okay, uh, yeah, thanks for those facts and figures. Um, uh, I'm the sorry, next hand Colleen I see... here, I'm listening. Did, did you need me to answer something? Sorry. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know if you heard us. The question was um, that, uh, you know, between the, um, uh, between the outcroppings and the tree pit, um, according to this diagram, there's a six foot, six inch um, gap. And, and Nancy was saying that usually DOT requires, what was it, Nancy, eight or eight and a half feet? Eight feet clearance is, is uh, standard. Eight feet clearance is standard. Uh, wondering if this uh, came up when DOT re reviewed this application. The applicant says DOT didn't raise any concerns, but wondering if you have um uh any any information about you know why eight feet is not required here because this is a side street and it's not a walk it's a narrow sidewalk um i understand you know what our franchise concession division which reviews a lot of our revocables consent they're very thorough and i'm sure that there's an explanation as to why it's six and a half as opposed to eight um but um i don't know what the um response is to that but I'm sure that they reviewed it, of course, which is what the applicant just mentioned and they had no objections with it. Yep, I mean, it definitely sounds like there were no objections, but um, it might be yeah. something that we just wanna note in the resolution. And as the applicant said, they have more flexibility with the tree pits and maybe the tree pits can be um, localized so that there's at least, you know, a eight foot yeah. diagonal perhaps um, in terms of the space. Uh, next question is from Mike Kavak. Yeah, in the same category, I notice it says restaurant entrance. If there's to be a restaurant at that location, I'm just wondering about the feasibility of outdoor dining 
would that be um, that would even lessen the space that six foot six would right. be even less? Yeah, that's that's a fair question. We we do not have any plans or designs to do outdoor dining. It's uh, it's not an it, it, nowhere near an efficient um, endeavor for us. Our kitchen lies literally 275 feet away from the sidewalk. Um, we'd have to pass through 275 feet of hallway to get to um, what would maybe amount to 10 tables. Um, it's not something we have in our business plan. It's not something we've ever explored. It's, uh, we'd have to walk through our lobby. It's, it, it's, it's a restaurant that services the hotel. It's a hotel restaurant, but that is our typical hotel restaurant entrance. So like I said, we, we, we just aren't contemplating outdoor seating, sidewalk seating, street seating, post-COVID seating. It's, it's not in our business plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nancy, do you might, have another question? We might question? put a few tables and chairs out there for guests to sit at no, ne next won't. to these beautiful trees, but we don't plan to have um, uh, food service or and definitely not alcohol service out there. Yep, thanks. Nancy, did you have an, did you have another question? I did. How how did you arrive at the uh, three foot six inch um, encroachment? The 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 the, the well, I'll let Todd take that one. Um. So we took the historic photographs and um, analyzed it and came up with the the one foot nine that you see on the plan is the kind of uh, pilasters. That are against that are engaged into the onto the facade and create the portal, and then we took the minimum distance that we figured we'd need for the ornamental fixture and the kind of bull nose detail that that uh, is in front of that. Could they be? Could they be? Could they be reduced in in uh, dimension? So they're, they're uh, not, they're, they're, you're, this is historical, you're, you, this is not actual historical fabric, right? You're introducing this. Correct. This is new. So, um, and Correct. so could, could, they, could they be back another way? In other words, you could remove that bollard part and remove the lamps and you could still have, you know, you could cut it in half. Am I right? That would cut it in half, removing the lamps. We felt that in landmarks kind of found the, right. the, 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 the would, lamp restoration appealing. The reason I'm asking is I want the committee to consider the fact that um, if those were removed, it would, um, it would reduce the encroachment and um, uh, give more space between the tree pit and the encroachment on the sidewalk. <clears throat> and it's not historical fabric that but is that is something also, you are adding but it's less just to just to note it's less of a protrusion than the current ramp right now the current ramp sticks out 5 feet by the time we're done we're out less than 5 feet just to note why are they so important to you what i mean from a historical significance he did intend or R.H. Robertson did intend to have a lantern at each of the portals but these are not the lanterns and this may not be the way it was determined this was designed is that correct i mean it's we're not stepping up three steps so it's not exactly as he designed you're absolutely correct but it is since we drop to sidewalk grade and the the columns go into place we would like to put the lanterns that he intended to have there and that puts us out three feet versus and like and the said, tree and, and the tree around. pit and the tree pit. Correct me if I'm wrong. And the tree pit reduces that that Look, width of that sidewalk. You're you're correct, 100. percent Like I said, we're we're much more flexible on the tree pit. Like we're we're trying to add some beautiful trees to the street, and if we can do that and maintain the lanterns, that would be our like primary objective. But there are, if, are the, but there are other ways that you could light these entrances as well. They're not really lighting the entrances, are they? They are, they're ornamental decoration. Decorative. Correct. They're decorative. Correct. Okay. They're decorative. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. David, do you have another question? Uh, if you could go back to the plan view again. Um, the or the other one? Yeah, the one that shows the full sidewalk. So, I mean, as an alternative, 
would it be possible just to have one tree pit that's sort of centered where that major pier is in this in the middle and then you you know open up the, the six foot six becomes 12 or something on a diagonal and but you only have one tree i think the math on i think the math on the tree pits was that based on the dimension of the overall frontage which called for two trees which we accommodated mm. but could that we, was, could we, could we go to one tree i mean I'm sure we could. We could go to no trees. I could make write a check to the parks department and not do any trees. I was trying to put some nice trees on the street. Well, I mean, I can only throw it out as an alternative. It's up to the committee, but yeah. I have to eliminate yeah, no, I, this I six that. foot six issue. And you know, there, there's a fair amount of foot okay. traffic on that street getting to uh, you know, particularly on green market days and. You have some retail neighbors that drive a fair amount of the traffic. So, yep, I know, I it's guess, something we, I, I it's something we could perhaps talk it. about in the comment period. Um, I think yep, I was just David. looking at it like we're going from five feet to three feet. Like we're we're improving the condition. I don't know. That's how I was seeing it. But. Uh, uh, well, right. What is the what is the clearance right now between the five foot ramp and the edge of the curb? Um, about 10 feet, six inches. Okay, so so the amount of clearance is going from 10 feet, six inches to six feet, six inches. Uh, you know, if, if, the, if the tree pit is only six, six away from the, um, uh, from the cheek walls. So, yeah, okay. I guess it's if there's tree pits at all, I guess is the bigger question, right? Right, right. Well, I mean, it, appreciate your answer about you know flexibility on the tree pits i think it's something we can talk about as a committee um in a couple minutes uh any other questions for the applicant from the committee all right uh not seeing any at this point we'll um open things up to uh members of the public if you have a question or a comment uh please use the um raise hand function uh, please, please use the function now so we know how many um, questions or comments we're going to get. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Uh, looks like there are going to be, um, it looks like there are going to be two. And uh, we'll start off with uh, Charles. Charles, go ahead. Hello, uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Hopefully, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so um, I'm a legally blind person, so it's hard for me to visualize everything. Um, I, I think it's important to mention that people who are legally blind, they, when they're walking along the sidewalks, they use the building line as a guide uh, with their cane. You know, sometimes uh, cellar doors and things like that can be hazards. Um, and again, sorry, I can't see the plans, but is there anything that's going to be sticking out or jagged edges or anything that could uh, trip someone over or have have, um, you know, like um, something sticking out that could uh, hit the person in the leg or knee or, um, you know, for someone who can't see, I mean, um, you know, walking along with a stick as they're uh, walking along um, that area. Um, thank you. Well, Char Charles, the application is fundamentally for um, four cheek walls on either sides of the two entrances that stick out um, three and a half feet. They're one and a, they're one foot three inches wide, and they stick out three and a half feet. Is that the kind of thing you're referring to, or are you asking about other protrusions as well? Uh, the encroachment on the sidewalk. I, I wasn't too sure. I couldn't really visualize what that was going to be like. Was it the lamps? I think was that the encroachment, or was I mistaken? I'm sorry. The encroachment is the wall, and the lamps are on top of the wall. Um, uh, could the applicant clarify how, how tall the walls are um, at the level that the lamps are sitting on? Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Or Todd, do you have section section view for dimension? But, they, but that, yeah, to be to clear, the, the, the lamps do not sit outboard of the cheek wall protrusion. They sit on top of 
the first two and two foot eight section of that cheek wall protrusion, they sit up. So they're not, it's not something that we're asking for. And then we're asking for even more that might right. be a hindrance yep. to someone that is legally blind. It's on top of a wall that's already part of our ask. Oh, great. And with narrowing the sidewalk, would that make uh, pedestrian tra traffic go to single file or is that uh, Charles? Be yeah, Charles, just to be totally clear, what we're asking is to actually improve the existing situation. The existing situation sticks out five foot something, five foot six. We are pulling it back to three foot. We're actually making the sidewalk larger. Okay, my apologies. Sorry, it's, it's with yeah, the graphics okay. and everything, I got kind of lost yeah, yeah. of no, what no, was no. happening. I, my apologies again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Uh, the next question or comment will be from T. Lawrence Wheaton. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. I, I just wanted to clarify, too, that the original design called for uh, these walls coming out uh, actually further uh, than they are proposed now. The original design had uh, the stairway as well, uh, though it abutted these uh, walls, two stairways. Um, That's correct. So it's not only this new design is not only less than the, uh, the, the previous design, but also less than the original design. Correct. Correct. Thank so you. The, so we're making it better okay. than it is right now, and we're we're sticking out less than R. H. Robertson's original design. That's correct. Gotcha. Oh, I have another question too. Uh, since you mentioned you know, sandstone being um, um, fragile, uh, how uh, successful do you think you're going to be in preserving the facade? I'll, I'll leave that one to Todd. Sure. Um, well, the, the, the building's in remarkable good shape from the second floor up. Clearly, the ground floor uh, was demolished in the 1950s. But the, um, the quarries that we're working with are the same quarries that uh, work a lot in uh, New York City. Uh, they recently just restored Trinity Church's uh, uh, sidewalk area and areaways. I'll stop, I'll stop you, Todd. Let me, let me rephrase it. Uh, how, how successful are you going to be in preserving it in terms of not having it fall down during construction or, de or deconstruction? Uh, yeah. Well, that's a that's a better, that's a different question altogether. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he meant to say, sorry. Pres preserving the facade brownstone is, is a delicate process, which we will take, the, you know, the best measures. But the... Um, the Department of Buildings um, and all the structural efforts being um, undertaken to keep this facade in place are have been being planned for two years now. I mean, we are taking such great care to make sure that this facade stays intact during the entire uh, demolition process. We, we talk about it daily. It's being managed daily by some of the best contractors in the city, and uh, we're very confident that it's going to be uh, remain intact. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for the question, Lauren. Um, seeing no other hands from any members of the public, um, I wanna thank the applicant uh, for engaging with us. The committee will now turn into its uh, business session where it's just for members of the committee to, um, uh, to discuss the application and any action um, uh, we would wanna take. You know, I'll just remind folks that, that you know, as has been stated several times, we are talking about the encroachment here, whether the encroachment is onto the sidewalk is appropriate, and what if any mitigations, you know, are necessary, you know, um, uh, as was said, um, the original facade encroached uh, uh, further out than, than what we're being presented with here. The ramp um, that has been in place uh, for many decades currently encroaches out further than this. Um, and in terms of in terms of the principle of turning uh, uh, public space, you know, over to the building, uh, you know, it, it, it does seem like it's it's a worthy reason to turn public space over to the building if we are indeed um, restoring something as historical as uh, the original facade and and doing it in a way uh, that uses even less space than the current. Um, uh, than the current or revocable consent or the original facade. Um, so that's really just speaking for myself, but that does seem to be a, a, a worthy reason. The one thing that we may want to raise in any resolution is to ask for, I, I, 
I don't think it's necessary to ask for no trees, but maybe a resituating or maybe only one tree to make sure that the current um, clearance space of 10 feet does not get reduced all the way to six feet. Those I think are my, my two initial comments, but I'll open it up to the committee at this point to any, um, uh, to any further comments on this application. We do need some comments. <laughs> Agree, disagree. Um, uh, don't make me call on people. Uh, yeah, fortunately. Uh, yeah, I agree with the same thing. I think it's uh, a noble endeavor to try to restore that building. I think we should try to be supportive of that as much as possible. I think cutting it to just the one tree in the front so that way you have the eight foot clearance in front of the building is more than reasonable um, ask. Thank you for the comment. Uh, Ryan. Uh, I'll, I'll just second that. Um, uh, I agree with um, the, um, the sentiment there and the, you know, that this would make sense as a, I would be comfortable with the committee weighing it accordingly. Thank you very much. This is uh, yeah, Noah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, I think also the um, a door being lowered, I think, is also a, a, a positive. Um, yeah. Yeah, certainly, you know, it's, it's a necessary improvement on the original facade that it remain ADA accessible. Was someone was someone at making another comment as well? Yeah, this is BJ Sung. I support your comment um, that all the other uh, committee members said. Um, having worked around there, I, I think it's a vast improvement on aesthetics and the whole neighborhood. Um, and I think it's great that they're trying to restore and be faithful to what the original building looked like. Thank you. Great, thanks, BJ. Um, okay. I, you know, let me know if there are any more comments from members of the committee, but it certainly sounds like we're leaning in the direction of a resolution uh, that would approve this uh, revocable consent application for these uh, three and a half foot cheek walls. You know, it, it sounds like we are okay with that, um, uh, uh, with that amount of outcropping. We particularly appreciate that it's, um, even less than the original facades outcropping and even less than the current outcropping. Um, and that, you know, the one uh, perhaps request, strong suggestion, uh, that we're pleased that the applicant um, indicated flexibility towards was maybe um, adjusting or reducing the true two trees to, to one tree or a configuration that that really maximizes the um, the clearance, so that the current ten and a half feet of clearance is not reduced only to six and a half feet, but but rather at least diagonally um, is is somewhat greater than that. Does that sound like an appropriate um, uh, resolution to members of the committee? Would anyone yes. like to yes, make a I motion? Yes, I think I motion. I make the motion to. Uh, make the resolution with the uh, stipulation about one tree pit rather okay. than deny, uh, <coughs> deny unless EJ deny unless sorry Mike we're not really we're not really in a public session um, right now uh, I don't know if any members of the committee uh, feel we need to do a deny unless but um, in general the uh, applicants seem to offer that they were very amenable to adjusting the trees and they certainly seem pretty flexible. Um, I guess it's up to the committee to let me to let us know if there's a, another comment or if anyone wants to second the motion that we heard. Should Noah, we did you have a comment? Should... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, and Nancy, either of you go ahead. Um, I um, should we put in something about how because the the sidewalk distance is narrow that um, there would, this community board would not be um, open to having uh, them come back for a sidewalk cafe permit since there's a restaurant there. I mean, I could see that we could come, that could be coming back later at another time or um, open, or, op or it could be open streets. 
We could we could certainly put a comment that we're that we're very concerned about the clearance in this area. You know, perhaps as a perhaps as a signal to you know we ourselves. Are we are too. We don't, you know, we, we have yeah. drop offs. Sorry, coming Trevor, in Trevor, hotel. unfortunately, we're not, Trevor, unfortunately, we're not in a dialogue no, sorry. Um, at this sorry, point. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so, uh, Nancy, I, I, you know, wouldn't have a problem with, with some kind of comment in the, um, in the resolution as to, you know, concern about uh, uh, the clearance and maintaining as much clearance uh, as possible given the, the street and, and, you know, that, that it would be a concern in any future. Um, applications for a sidewalk cafe or an open restaurant or anything like that. I have no problem with, with adding that to the resolution. Noah, did you have another comment? Um, no, I just wanted to second uh, Sarah's okay. motion. Sarah, do you want to do you want to re-motion now that we've uh, added it to week? Uh, I motion that we uh, approve this um, application uh, with the stipulation that Maybe there could just be one tree pit instead of two. If that's Thank the way you. to say it, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, with all the with all the comments that we have that we have mentioned, uh, and is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, with that, we will take it to a, we will take this to a um, vote, uh, and I'll call the roll. We'll start with Zach. Yes. Fortunato. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Nancy. Yes. I don't see Kathy. Um, I don't see Megan. Uh, Maki. Yes. David. Yes. Noah. Yes. Uh, BJ. Yes. Uh, Pete. Yes. Uh, Ryan. Yes. Janice. Yes. George. Uh, yes. And Joel. Yes. Okay. Uh, that um, uh, resolution passes our committee. Um, thank you uh, very much to the applicant. Uh, for coming in. We appreciate your um, your engagement tonight. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank okay, you. Thanks for um, so thank you all. Uh, with that, we will um, move on to our second item of the evening, uh, which is going to be um, a little bit more of a discussion. Uh, this discussion is not so much spurred by any new application um, or action, but uh, rather a discussion that we thought it makes sense to have at this juncture. As you likely know, um, for the last couple of years, the state has had a plan to expand Penn Station and redevelop the neighborhood around it. Um, the, the, the incredibly short context and history is that uh, community, you know, without, without reliving the entire um, uh, life of the plan over the past two years, uh, this general project plan, the last uh, piece of action that we took on it was for Community Board 5 to uh, summarily reject this general plot project plan or GPP um, in December. Uh, we took a vote and adopted that uh, uh, as a formal position of community board five. Um, you know, this GPP is one specific plan for expanding Penn Station's rail capacity uh, via building new tracks in a Southern expansion, combined with a uh, land use plan to redevelop the area around it and build 10 new skyscrapers. The, the GPP was this expansion and 10 skyscraper land use plan uh, uh, stapled together. And CB5 um, rejected this, this specific combination of plans in December. What we officially said in our rejection is that expanding Penn Station's capacity is absolutely necessary, but that these two specific plans uh, stapled together in this specific way really didn't evaluate all of the options for expanding Penn Station's capacity. And uh, Community Board 5 also said that deciding 
how to expand Penn Station's capacity should definitely come before deciding how to pay for expansion and figuring out how much it'll cost and thus how much development uh, we would um, we would need for that. So that was a position that Community Board 5 uh, voted on and adopted in December. Um, we are at a position here where we know that one of the next steps as the state continues to pursue this GPP is that the feds will need to do a review of any um, expansion of the station, uh, which will likely take the form of a federal NEPA review in which they are required to evaluate alternatives um, to, to an expansion plan before they can green light one. Uh, this kind of puts us in a position where this is an opportunity um, for, for us to go back to the drawing board, so to speak, and, and say at this point in time, what different alternatives to Southern expansion we think should be evaluated against each other in a rigorous way. Uh, we, can, we can help frame the scope of that review, which we know is coming, and um, which will, uh, you know, according to, it, to, to the federal process, which will begin with a draft scope document where they define what, you know, what will be evaluated, followed by a final scope scoping document, followed by a um, draft environmental impact statement where those alternatives are evaluated, followed by a final EIS. Um, so really we're in a position right now where before that process has even started, we can perhaps help frame the scope of that review and help let them know what we think should be included as, as viable alternatives. Uh, and, and just for a bit of additional context, our neighbors to the West, Community Board 4 themselves, <laughs> um, uh, uh, which of course is uh, the, the Penn Station complex straddles 8th Avenue, and um, uh, community board four is the, is the you know, uh, the component, uh, they're, they're not as affected by the GPP as us, but there are certainly lots, um, including Moynihan and the block uh, just to the south of Moynihan that, that were affected by the GPP. Community board four themselves adopted a similar, uh, adopted a statement last month, supporting uh, through running um, which you'll probably hear about tonight as one option that should be rigorously evaluated. Um, so, you know, one, one thought is that what Community Board 5 can adopt at this point in time is not necessarily, you know, uh, we're, not, we're not engineers here um, exactly. And I, don't, and I don't think we should be trying to, you know, uh, rigorously evaluate the benefits of all the different uh, uh, potential alternatives tonight, um, nor should we, you know, uh, take 10 hours arguing engineering details. Um, what I do think we're in a position to do potentially is um, to adopt a statement or resolution as a board in which we list the alternatives that we think uh, absolutely should be rigorously evaluated in a in a in a legitimate you know engineering evaluation at a federal level. Um, so I think you know what we want to do tonight is to uh, is to hear uh, some advocacy for some alternatives in an abbreviated fashion, um, so that we can decide you know again not which one is best tonight, but which one should be evaluated. Um, as, as potential alternatives. And the output of tonight could be a statement about what we think should go into the scope of that federal, uh, federal um, uh, review. Obviously there's, there's a lot um, we could continue to discuss uh, later on to provide a little bit of framing before we dive into um, those specific uh, 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 statements. We've got a, we've got a couple, um, a couple advocates who have who have brought presentations tonight, which we'll hear in in um, abbreviated fashion, five minutes um, a piece, is what we'll ask uh, folks to stick to. We'll of course also have a, a public session as well, where anyone attendant in attendance can speak to or advocate um, uh, whatever they would like. But just you know, once again, to sort of define the scope of what we're talking about, 
Um, I'm going to start with a brief uh, presentation here um, to, to sort of indicate uh, what we want to talk about this evening. Uh, if I can share my screen in just a moment. Basically, I want to take this opportunity to set the stage a little bit for the committee um, in terms of what we'll hear about and what might be part of this, um, this discussion. Uh, I've prepared a bunch of really simplified slides here um, and uh, try, trying to indicate how gro grossly simplified they are by um, making them a little bit cartoonish here. I don't pretend to be an engineer and I made these uh, sort of um, simple to reflect that, but this matches my best understanding of some of the options that we might hear tonight and want to make part of, um, of this discussion. Uh, to start, you know, I want to, I want to clarify what we should be talking about. We know there's a GPP, which was a plan to, to develop 10 skyscrapers around Penn Station. CB5 uh, formally rejected this. There's also, of course, an arena sitting on top of Penn Station. There are other skyscrapers sitting on top of Penn Station. Um, there, are, there are many opinions about uh, what should happen to those. As we said in our statement in December, the position of CB5 is that above ground development should and, and paying for thing, you know, um, uh, uh, any development to pay for uh, expansion should really follow from making a judgment about the best future of the capabilities of Penn Station. So tonight, you know, we want to focus our commentary on not development above ground, but development below, you know, what, what's happening below ground? What is, what is the best strategy for um, the capabilities of Penn Station, you know, at, at, the, uh, at the functional level? Um, and I'm going to try to talk through uh, the, the rogues gallery of, of several of them tonight, just so um, we, have a, we have a common uh, uh, glossary for referring to them. Um, first off, you know, one, one important piece of information and something that seems to have a tremendous amount of momentum at the federal level is the building of, of uh, the two new gateway program uh, tunnels that will be coming in across the Hudson. Uh, there's, there's a widespread assumption that these will be built, that they'll present Penn Station with an opportunity to take advantage of eventually greater capacity by presenting um, more redundancy and, and double the capacity uh, under, the hub, under the Hudson River. Um, of course, with more trains coming in, that's why Penn Station would need eventually to figure out how to load and unload more trains to take advantage of that. Um, some details about the gateway tunnels are not figured out yet. Uh, the end of the tunnels could example uh, be configured to, to best connect to the existing tracks or as was proposed in the GPP, um, could be configured to best connect to new tracks built to the south. Once again, this is what this is the expansion option that was proposed as part of the GPP. Um, there are other new track alternatives that are commonly mentioned as being uh, alternatives to southern expansion that will very likely be among those alternatives that are evaluated at the federal level. If, if you know, uh, uh, rumor and conversation of the participating agencies is any indication. Um, one is a, what I would call a deep cut um, uh, creation of new tracks below the existing track level along the lines of uh, what was done with east side access under Grand Central Terminal. It would create new tracks, a new station at an entirely lower level. It would probably be a major construction project just like East Side Access was. Another would be a expansion to the north, probably, probably reconfiguring and redeveloping a number of blocks to the north or, or, some, kind of, you know, or some kind of deep boring, uh, which would build new tracks and a new station to the north. This was similar to what was proposed as part of the uh, ARC plan um over a decade ago the canceled arc plan uh this itself would be a major development but it's likely to be one of the alternatives that probably the feds would compare to a southern expansion which of course is what um uh the state will be asking uh to be evaluated 
Um, some other proposals can uh, probably be done within the footprint of the current station. One concept you might hear about is to uh, lengthen uh, some of the existing tracks, like tracks one to four, to make them the same length as other tracks to run more full-size trains on these tracks and increase capacity that way. Another proposal you'll likely hear more details about tonight is using an existing right-of-way that exists to build a uh, two-track tunnel to Grand Central. This would enable new types of runs and connections between the two stations. Another proposal that gets a lot of talk is through running, which would be using the existing footprint of Penn Station to run more trains from New Jersey through Penn Station and onward to points east, either via existing platforms or as is often um, proposed by widening the platforms, which would be a way to load and unload trains at the same time and thus run more volume per hour. And again, you'll probably hear some of these details from, from advocates uh, who are speaking later tonight, but you know, I wanted to sort of uh, illustrate um, you know, a number of these different options that we'll probably hear about on the same screen uh, to get across you know, with, with, again, these kind of cartoony diagrams uh, that there are a lot of options. And importantly, they're not necessarily all mutually exclusive, Given probably infinite political will and infinite money, you could do several of these things at the same time. You could build new tracks, you could widen existing tracks, you could you could build a tunnel, um, et cetera. They're not mutually exclusive, but um, money and political will is not infinite. And at some point, uh, the question will come, how, uh, will, will be you know uh, asked how best to uh, expand the capacity of 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 the station. Um, so the real question is, you know, what, what would the priority approach be? What do we want to spend our money on? And then ultimately, how much does it cost and how do we pay for it? How do we build it? Um, so once again, tonight, we're trying to build a list of things to evaluate, to weigh against each other so we could start to learn more about these things. And I think we'll, we'll hear some more about, um, you know, what questions we don't have answered about some of these uh, uh, later tonight as well. Um, you know, with that, uh, again, we're not doing that rig rigorous evaluation tonight. I think we want to come up with a list of what to include in the federal review and, and make that, make that our output, make that our ask of the evening. And, um, you know, in that, in that vein, uh, we're going to try to hear as many, um, perspectives as we can in abbreviated fashion. Again, we'll try to limit presentations with slides to, um, to five minutes, and as usual, any any public comments will probably try to limit to um, two minutes apiece. Uh, so with that, we do have three um, three uh, groups and folks who have contacted the um, the board office with uh, uh, with slides um, that we'll uh, now get a chance to hear from. Uh, the first will be uh, Barry Caro from uh, Rethink NYC. So. Um, Barry, I believe you should have just been promoted to panelist. And at this point, you should be good to share your screen and, um, and get started. And, and you know, once again, I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna set a timer just so we can stick to as close to five minutes as possible. All right, time's out, so it should be just about five minutes. Great. Um, let me do share screen. Just give me one moment here. Uh, so everybody uh, can see my screen right now? We can. Great. Um, so right now, uh, and thank you for that introduction, um, I'm gonna be speaking on behalf of Rethink Studios, uh, talking about through running at Penn Station, within Penn Station, um, within the existing footprint. Um, we believe the governor's current proposal is development first, transit maybe, and we think that is just the exact wrong way to approach this. So what is uh, the bottom line about through running? It's an approach that costs less, involves the exact same agencies, delivers better service, and can be built just as quickly as the proposed terminal uh, that you heard about. 
And this is the sort of standard approach that you see around the world from other cities when they are looking to uh, expand capacity in their in their downtowns, whether it's London, Paris, Munich, Tokyo, what you see are trains running through the middle of the city to a destination on the far side rather than turning around in a downtown terminal, which is how things uh, were done for, for a long time. Uh, the reason for that is twofold. One, uh, you can run more trains through if you're not having to turn them around. And two, um, it provides a whole new set of destinations for people on the far side of the downtown core. It takes you from a system where everybody is being sent into midtown Manhattan to a system where you can get to more destinations around the region, providing the same kind of benefits you currently get only in midtown to more places. Now we started uh, with the gateway program. We changed nothing about gateway west of 10th Avenue. So not the tunnels, not the infrastructure in New Jersey. And instead we changed their approach to the station by canceling the expansion south of the station, which is what they're currently looking to do, which when you add it all up is about $18 billion worth of proposed projects. Uh, and instead propose about eight to $10 billion worth of projects to support through running. Now, Penn Station is by no means the only source of problems in the New York metro area transit system. Anyone that tried, tried to get around knows that, but it is the biggest one because it's the one that is the largest transportation um, node in the tri state. And so, if we want to fix our problems, we need to start from there. Now, the problem is not that Penn Station is too small. The problem is that it is inefficiently operated. And since the problem isn't size, expansion isn't the answer. The problem is that when you have a train from New Jersey come in, unload all its passengers, get checked for sleeping passengers, switch engineer positions, check the brakes, then announce on the screen in Penn Station, you're on track four, everybody rushes over to come down, and then it goes back to New Jersey and that takes half an hour. That is the problem in operations at Penn Station. Now we went through and we looked at what are the obstacles to doing a through running system around the whole region. And we looked at the, um, the things that you would need to do to get them done. And this color coding here are things that are either moving forward have already or already been done, that's in green, things that would need to be slightly modified in yellow and things that are new to our plan, which are in red. So as you can see, most of the things we're talking about are things that have already happened or are moving forward to, to support this project. Now it's not just an $18 billion reason why we have to remove Penn, Penn South. We know that it's not necessary because Amtrak told us as much a decade ago. When they studied this in 2014, they looked at a number of different options for how to operate trains. They found that immediately going to a full through running system, which is not what we're proposing, would reduce capacity. But doing a hybrid system where you kept the trains that are going empty to, to uh, Hudson Yards the same, but got rid of those turning trains that I talked about, that would theoretically yield a 25% increase in capacity in the station. Now, that is not enough to meet 100% of the long-term need, but it is enough to get started. And this is a, a quick um, breakdown of exactly why, of exactly how the operations differ in Penn Station. Now, why is it, it enough to... Um, get started because if you can run the same number of trains on fewer tracks, you can take tracks out of service to up, update them. And what we do with that is, as EJ mentioned, we widen platforms, we lengthen platforms too. This is a comparison of the proposed before and after here. Um, you triple the number of stairs and escalators in the station, double the platform width so that on fewer tracks, but wider platforms, you can serve more trains. This is a, a close-up of something you saw earlier, comparing and contrasting how people are able to use the system uh, in a through-running uh, system with wider platforms versus the status quo. And in terms of capacity here, it delivers a significant increase in capacity versus the proposal from the MTA, which is for about a 39% increase in capacity versus a what we've estimated as a 50% increase in the capacity of the station with a through-running system. 
Um, I'll just ask you to to uh, to wrap I think up. I got if you one can. left here. This is a comparison of some of the numbers. That second one there, that thirty five percent increase, was a a compromised version of through running that the MTA presented to the Community Action Working Group. But we think that even that at half the price for near for ninety percent of the capacity is worth it. With that, I that is my last slide. So I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll create some time after each of these uh, three presentations to allow um, you know, one or two questions from the, uh, uh, from the committee members if, they, if they'd, like to, um, they'd like to ask one. I think I'll start with, with one, Barry, which is, which is just um, in terms of widening those platforms, is that construction work that needs to be done at once? Is that construction work that is done gradually? Does, does the station continue to operate while that is happening? We developed a staging plan so that at no point in time do you have to run fewer trains into Penn Station than ran pre-COVID. Um, the way you can accomplish that is, as I said, you can run the same number of trains on somewhere between 12 and 25 percent. That's the low and high estimate. Uh, fewer minutes, meaning you can do it on between 18 and 16 tracks uh, versus the 21 tracks that are there right now. So if you uh, initially take out, I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but if you take out three tracks initially in that first stage, you upgrade them so that your resulting tracks can, can service those higher number of trains I was talking about. You then alternate to the other side of the station. You go back and forth so that at no point are you running fewer trains. It would continue to operate throughout, uh, throughout the entire time. And at the end of it, sort of all of the tracks would be updated, would be upgraded, but at no time are you taking it out of service. Thanks. And you showed you showed two variants there. One with you know the you showed two things side by side the the existing platforms and wider platforms. Um, is there any benefit at all to increased through running but without widening the platforms, or does the real value come from widening the platforms? Um, so there is so that initial uh, twelve to twenty five percent capacity increase is a capacity increase that Amtrak found for through running with no improvements to Penn Station itself. We okay. believe you can get to a 50% capacity increase if you also widen the platforms and do right. the other things we're talking about, but the widening of the platforms is the single biggest chunk of money that you're talking about. Okay, thank you. Any other questions um, from any members of the committee? Yeah, David. Um, Barry, the uh, I guess part of the justification of the of the expansion was the increased um, ridership that's projected. You know, I forget what it was out to two thousand fifty or something. And and does your plan also accommodate that growth as well as whatever the twenty nineteen yeah. demand was? Yeah, yeah actually, um, so our project, what we believe are, and we have sort of a. a 80 page submission we just submitted to the GPP comments process on this, but we believe um, our plan would provide for an overall 50% increase in train movements and an increase in length of trains, allowing all trains to be at least 12 cars long, uh, whereas some of the New Jersey transit platforms right now are just nine cars long. So we believe the overall increase in the number of passengers that could go through the station would be something on the order of 55 to 60%, which is more than the expansion proposes. And, and I guess my other question is, a lot of these patterns don't exist today. If I live in Jersey City, I'm probably not taking a job in White Plains because it's hard to get to. Yeah. And so the system would allow those kinds of connections, but presumably it takes an extended period of time for people to change their living patterns to take advantage of that. Is, is that true? Is that not it, a it, fair it's, assumption? It, it's, it's partially true. But the thing about New York is that it's so big that there's actually a lot of people who are already driving from New Jersey to Eastern Queens and Long Island every day and, and vice versa. Um, if you look at the census commuting data, um, you can find um, something on the order of about 25,000 people a day, each direction commuting between Eastern Queens and New Jersey. Uh, those are people who would potentially be customers. Uh, you look at the East, uh, and, and then just in, in, 
the other part of it is sort of amenities that you can only get to from one side of the region. So my favorite chart about that that I didn't have time to share is if you look at where people go to JFK airport versus where people go to Newark airport, there is only one area overlap and that is Midtown Manhattan uh, where people you know choose between the two. Otherwise, everybody basically goes to one or the other. Um, whereas this system, you'd be on a one seat ride from New Jersey to JFK or you'd be on a one seat ride uh, from Long Island and Queens and the Bronx to Newark. So it would give people uh, just, just sort of one example of the kinds of things that people would be able to all of a sudden be able to access without having to completely upend their lives. And from a permitting standpoint, is your proposal somehow permitted differently than the Penn South process would Our be? Our proposal, um, uh, it's the same agencies involved and it's, with, but it's within the existing footprint of the Penn Moynihan campus, 7th to 9th avenues, uh, 31st to 33rd streets versus the expansion uh, also goes um, south of um, the existing, uh, excuse me, the proposed expansion goes south of the existing station and crosses um, 7th Avenue uh, briefly over there. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, well, not seeing any other questions from the committee. Thanks, thanks, Barry, for that that presentation. I hope you'll stick around. Um, uh, but we really appreciate it. Um, uh, at this point, we'll we'll move on to a um, uh, uh, second um, presentation, uh, which uh, will be from uh, committee member George Hikalis, who. Uh, has provided some slides um, from his own organization, uh, which I will bring up right now. And per, um, I think what you told me, George, I will go to slide eight. Yes. There it is. Go for it, George. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> Yes, we can. This is uh, a plan that was uh, developed as part of the Access to the Region's Core study that was done in 2003. Uh, I was around in 2003. <laughs> you can see I've been around a long time. And uh, I did want to comment on uh, uh, EJ's uh, uh, presentation at the beginning that while he may not be a civil engineer like I am, He's pretty close with some of those drawings. Congratulations, very nice uh, depiction of uh, these options. Um, this option here, alternative G, not named after me, but named after Grand Central Terminal, was um, one of several that were uh, studied in the ARC project. At the time, Metro North and New Jersey Transit would have to cooperate to do that to run the system because the trains would run from one system to the other. Uh, Metro North was adamantly opposed to losing their independence. Uh, their independence really comes from the taxpayers who generously provide money for commuter rail, which would be totally shut down if it weren't for uh, tax subsidies. So I think the independence is a little bit of an illusion. As you can see, and it's a little hard to see on this drawing, but. Uh, uh, there would be a two track connection under 31st Street and then turning north under Park Avenue and plugging into the lower level of Grand Central. So there would be no new stations constructed. It would just be a two track connection between the two stations and trains would come from New Jersey, west of Hudson, let's say, make a, a stop at Penn, continuing on to Grand Central and then continuing on to destinations to the north. This was through running, but this would be very similar to the uh, RER in Paris, to the uh, S-Bahn in Berlin, to the uh, Thames Link, which is built 20 years ago in London, or a new cross London, which is just now being detailed. Running through the business district with two stops, has tremendous advantages for pe people west of the Hudson 
can get to the uh, destiny workplaces in East Midtown, which is where the uh, center of action is if it ever returns. I think we have to be a little cautious about how much we will recover from the catastrophic COVID infection and, uh, and be a little on the realistic side somewhere along the way. But in any, any event, this, was, this drawing was produced by Parsons Brinkerhoff, which at that time was the largest engineering firm in New York City, maybe in the country. And if, if they say it could be done, that's good enough for me, even though as a civil engineer, I would have preferred to have seen more details, which have never been made available to the public. And I think that ought to be one of the first requests from Community Board 5. Uh, I would add one other thing that this is not a project to help people get around locally between the two locations in Board 5. These are central connections for the whole area to the west and the whole area to the north. And planning for those groups should be uh, part of a, a comprehensive plan. Now, that we don't have people participating from west of the Hudson on any of this discussion. So I think it's very important that we have a multi-state metropolitan vision. Now here's the second drawing, and this is an, uh, a, a piece that I, I have to give credit to former Governor Pataki, because he's the, the one who pushed very hard to have a bus subway free transfer, transfer which, which did, get, did happen. And he wanted to have a free transfer between the commuter rail and the subways and buses, which happened in only a very tiny way. Uh, so we give him great, give him credit for that. Um, uh, this is uh, if in the city, uh, if we had just the commuter rail stations that were made part of our current system, fully available for people with a monthly, weekly, one day three hour pass, then the, uh, this whole system in the current system with even without the link between the two stations would be much more useful to all of us. And that's something that we as, uh, even though board five with its uh, substantial population of commuters and, uh, and workplace destinations needs to be aware that this is a plan for all of us, and we need to really have a very inclusive planning process. And I think uh, uh, EJ has heard about that from comprehensive plans that I've ranted around uh, through the years. So uh, he's getting tired of hearing it probably. But in any event, these are the two pieces that I wanted to show. And thank you very much for putting them up. I'd be glad to take any questions, comments, et cetera, right now or later. Thanks, George. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, so in terms of, in terms of the, the, you know, trying, trying to bring it around to what could potentially be evaluated as part of, you know, uh, alternatives to the expansion, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly if a NEPA review of alternatives would get into the fair components, but in terms of infrastructure that would need to be built, you know, fair components are, are rail, rail systems deciding to, uh, coordinate with each other, <laughs> correct? Um, in terms of the infrastructure needed, um, it sounds like you're, we'd be referring specifically to that um, alternative G tunnel between the two stations. Yes, Are, am I missing any other necessary infrastructure components? That's the primary one. Uh, yes, it, of course, it's, uh, uh, this was studied in detail by Parsons Brinkerhoff and we ought to really insists that the, the detail be made widely available, not just a sketch that you saw on the uh, roll here. Okay, thank you. Um, do, uh, do any members of the, um, of the committee have questions? I see that uh, my, my colleague, uh, Layla, who is the uh, chair of the Land Use Housing and Zoning Committee and, and was also on the, um, uh, the uh, GPP working group uh, has her hand up, Layla. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, EJ. Thank you so much for putting together this, uh, uh, this meeting. It's really a super important uh, conversation that uh, I hope the uh, uh, railroads are having. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I actually have a, a technical question that I don't know who it is for, but hopefully uh, maybe Barry, maybe George uh, has a, a, a sense of how to address that. My understanding is that New Jersey Transit has catenary uh, system while New Jer uh, Long Island has a third rail and that in order to be truly through running, you basically have to convert one or the other but that basically it's like they don't really speak the same language. Do, did I get that explained correctly by some people who may be less enthused than I am about through running? And what is the response to that? I can answer that in, in part. Yes, they use different propulsion. I will say that the 1994 Long Island Railroad study on that found it would be a very minor thing to have rolling stock, the trains that can run on both networks, for example, uh, the New Haven line right now has the M8s, which run on overhead wire in Connecticut and in New York, north of Mount Vernon, and then run on third rail into Grand Central, because that's what Metro North has in Grand Central. Uh, we spoke actually to the manufacturers of New Jersey Transit's um, new double-decker orders, Bombardier, and they indicated that adding a third rail shoe to do the to convert um, the that piece of rolling stock into a piece of rolling stock that could work on both networks would be a minimal cost, um, particularly be, just because for some technical reasons. But you can you can absolutely have trains that run on both networks without a problem. I would and add that, that uh, they not all trains need to be universal. That that if you're going to have two uh, two new tunnels from the Hudson, across the Hudson and the existing tunnels, and then we're going to link up, say, to Grand Central. The trains that are doing the linking up need to obviously have to be compatible, but the others don't necessarily have to, at least initially. So in evaluating these options, you need to be careful to be you know, reasonably accurate as to what you include <laughs> in a plus and minus on each option. Yeah, just super quick, that's something that George's proposal and ours have in common and that we also have the existing rolling stock not running through as well and make provisions for that. Sure. If, if I can do just a quick follow up uh, in terms of a price tag, because they're, they're telling us and, you know, like conversation that I've had with, with some people who have some expertise are telling me that, you know, it would be cost prohibitive. Uh, how do we counter this argument? Well, I think it's important uh, in, in estimating costs to have uh, an interested third, disinterested third party participate in this. As uh, I, I think our late, or not late, but <laughs> former governor had for dealing with the, the L train debate about whether you had to shut down the whole thing for a year or whether you could do it in a very incremental way. And he, he brought the deans of Columbia University and Cornell University engineering schools uh, to debate that issue. Well, of course, they should really be overlooking their uh, uh, enterprise and, and not spending time doing things like that, but it was very helpful. And he actually, the, the two deans said, look, there are established ways to do these things differently than the plan that was proposed by the engineers. And I think one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that the engineers, and I'm a civil engineer, but, and I'm, I'm proud of that, but nonetheless, not all civil engineers are quite as honest as they should be. Because if you're designing a project and you know that you get your fee is based on a percent of the total cost, you're, there's, they're not, there's not the same incentive to be cost effective. The more cost the project is, the more your fee will be. So therefore you pick the most costly approach or the uh, technique or whatever it is. So I think you need to have a, again, a disinterested third party evaluating costs so that you actually get a fair uh, estimate of what they are. I would also add that, um, Leo, I think I believe you were on the Community Action Working Group, that when the MTA uh, did their presentation on their version of through running, which I sort of obliquely mentioned, um, they found that completely redoing the entire middle of Penn Station, which is a more um, impactful set of projects than what we're talking about, would cost about $3 billion. 
uh, to provide 90% of the capacity improvement that they would get from expanding the station for $18 billion. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think even using the MTA's own numbers, it's kind of a slam dunk. Beyond that, I would ask them to sort of, as George says, one, a disinterested third party has to be looking at this. But beyond that, I we in our more detailed presentations that I would be happy to share with anybody on here, uh, EJ, I'll, I'll email it to you a, after this as well, in addition to my slides, which, which I emailed just a little while ago. Um, we, cost, we, we looked through every element of our project. We found what was the last comparable project that the MTA or NJ Transit or Amtrak did that was similar to this. And we said, it'll cost that much. We're not going to say we can do it for, for less. We're going to say it costs that much. And doing that got us to about eight to 10 billion versus 17 billion. And just the final point, um, you know, New Jersey Transit and the MTA say, we love through running, we just want to do it later. Their version of that is to do it in 2080 and add an entirely new set of tunnels under the East River, which I don't know about you, but I think that's going to cost a lot more than anything we're talking about here uh, to build an entirely new set of tunnels from Penn Station out to like, you know, Woodside. So uh, if you're looking at the best way to get through running done, I don't think there's any comparison. I think Thanks. there needs to be- Thanks, a, in, George. Yeah, am I too late? Uh, but basically- One, is, one last comment, and then I want to make sure to get to our third presenter. I'm sorry. I, I, maybe I, there is through running now. The trains come from New Jersey. They unload at Penn Station. They go out into Sunnyside Yard and sit there all day long. That's through running. The thing is, uh, those trains that have dual-powered uh, locomotives can, can, can have continued all the way to Montauk Point, if you wanted. Wherever you wanted to do, you have to have the railway systems cooperate with each other. They have people that could do the innovation and come up with the appropriate schedules. But if they're adamantly against cooperating, then you don't have through running, period. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. We'll, we'll have some more opportunity for questions, but I do want to get to our to the third and final person who sent in slides uh, for the evening, um, which is uh, uh, Joe Clift. Um, Joe, I have your slides that I can begin sharing um, uh, on your behalf. I believe you wanted to um, join by phone. Marisa, you may have to remind me um, how a member, how someone who was joined by phone uh, can speak. They, it like uh, sure, it's uh, star six. Press star six on your phone to unmute yourself and star nine to raise your hand. So if you wanted to raise his hand, um, he could press star nine, but uh, if it's okay to just go ahead and, and start speaking, just star nine. Joe, let us know um, if you're speaking and we'll let you know if we can hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. Hi, Vicki. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, my name is Joe Clift. Uh, I used to be on board five. Uh, back before Vicki was chair, so it's been a while. And in a, in a past life, I was head of planning at the Long Island Railroad. Um, and I guess I'm the cheapskate today because what I want to talk about is how do you get improvements spending the least amount of money? And this first slide just simply shows that, that uh, the new gateway tunnels uh, and the section from the river to the east end of Hudson Yards has been built or is being built. That, that's called the, uh, the tunnel box. And what you can see from here is that you can go into Penn Station proper. You can go down to a Penn South or a Penn Expansion because the tracks always start at the same point at 10th Avenue. Um, and I might add that if Community Ward 5 is going to get serious about service into Penn Station, they're going to have to look all the way to New Jersey because the plans in New Jersey affect how the trains come into New York. So, EJ, if you can go to the second slide, please. This uh, is a, a quick overlay just to give you a sense that most of you may know it, but uh, Madison Square Garden is the not quite circle on the right. That's over Penn Station proper. And you can see slightly to the left across 8th Avenue is Moynihan Train Hall. The center tracks go all the way to 9th Avenue. Um, 20 cars, 25 cars as possible. But going from south to north, the lower four tracks serve only New Jersey Transit. They're short tracks. Uh, they don't go anywhere to the east. 
and they do not go far enough to the west to get to the West End Concourse. For those of you who are familiar with Penn Station, you cannot get to Moynihan Train Hall from them. The center tracks, uh, tracks 3 through 12, are shared by Amtrak and New Jersey Transit. They all go into Moynihan Train Hall. Um, they also all go east to uh, um, Long Island and to Sunnyside Yard. And then the tracks above that, the uh, gray tracks are shared by, uh, that's 13 through, through 17, they're shared by the Long Island Railroad and the New Jersey Transit only in the afternoon. And then the four, the, the four north tracks in pink are Long Island Railroad only. That's the setup today. Next slide, please, EJ. Okay, this is a, a, a map I put together quite a while ago that shows you the massive footprint of what then was called Penn South, which you're now calling Penn Expansion. It's not just 780 below Penn Station, which you can see here in blue, Madison Square Garden and, and Two Penn Plaza. It extends to the east well across 7th Avenue uh, because the tracks have to be long enough to handle 12-car trains, and it extends west of, of, uh, eight, of 9th Avenue. I'm sorry, 8th Avenue. So it's a very large footprint, and that makes it not only expensive but intrusive. And I just wanted to show that. Next slide, EJ, please. So what I want to talk about now, my concept basically is to improve Penn Station to the max without expanding its footprint, without changing the width of the platforms. And there are two areas here. You see in the center, an orange area. That's what's called the Long Island Railroad Central Corridor, which goes from 13 up to 21. That would be extended down to track one. That adds capacity. Vertical capacity, uh, I think Barry talked about it, George has talked about some of this, but more vertical capacity allows you to get people off the platforms and on the platforms quickly. That's the secret to getting more productivity out of the station. And then to the west, you can see the uh, um, orange areas at the bottom. That would be an extension of tracks one through four to get far enough west to get to the uh, West End Concourse, which gives you access to Moynihan. And when you do this, all the tracks can handle 12 cars. Everybody can get into Moynihan Train Hall. Everybody can get into Penn Station proper. And you have a station that is universal in its capability. And that's very important. When you add more vertical access, you can move trains more quickly. Uh, last slide, EJ, please. I'm sorry, next to last slide. One of the issues that, that Board 5 has raised, I think, is at, I think at some point you talked about moving Madison Square Garden off of uh, Penn Station. It's not necessary from a station performance point of view. The single level approach that was uh, put together by the MTA, uh, Governor Hochul did a re, uh, redux on this, but there's plenty of height capability. If you take out what we normally call the Amtrak level, you've got the Long Island level that's just above the platform level, and then you've got the Amtrak level above that. You rip that out throughout the station, throughout the station, you got plenty of headroom. You can have a nice, amenable station. You do not have to rip things off up above. Um, and you can see over on the right, two levels doesn't work because you've still got low headroom. And now the last slide, EJ. So the simple question is, can it improve to the max Penn Station handle future peak hour rail passenger demand? I would argue that from the standpoint of Board 5 and anybody that, that, that's interested in accessibility, fixing up Penn Station whether you have through running with wider platforms, the same platforms, it's the best access to the subways. They're not down at 30th Street. They're up at 33rd on the East uh, 7th Avenue and 34th on the 8th. The existing station has far better subway access, and it's a block closer to most people's destinations. If you build the pin expansion south of 31st Street, you're just making people walk further. But the key here is, can this improved station handle the future capacity? And the first thing I would say, yes, provided you forecast rationally. It's never been done in the past. And the simple example, 59,000 uh, was the actual New Jersey Transit Long Island Railroad 2019 peak hour volume. 59,000 arrivals in the peak hour between the two railroads. The forecast for the future between east side access and ARC, which was the, the predecessor to Gateway, 93,000 arrivals in the, in the short term, 2020 to 2025. 
Everybody over forecasts they want to build big, so they use fake numbers to do that. The Long Island, number one, Long Island Railroad ridership into Penn is now two-thirds of what the forecast was for east side access. It's actually 33,000 arrivals. That's down from 39,000 in 1995. Yes, the Long Island Railroad peak hour service is shrinking, but the forecast for east side access was 49,000, way over. Second thing, when east side access opens, almost immediately the forecast is that 44% of the Long Island Railroad peak hour riders that go into Penn now are going to go into the east side access. That means that the Long Island Railroad's 33,000 peak hour riders now is going to drop to 19,000. So you can see that there's tremendous reduction in ridership from Long Island. New Jersey transit growth can, take, can handle that, can take use of that. And it just, if you forecast rationally instead of optimistically. And third, New Jersey Transit's 2019 26,000 peak hour ridership will make it the dominant carrier once Seaside Access opens, which changes things only because the customers coming in from New Jersey could move up into the New York controlled platforms. Of course, New York's not going to give up anything to New Jersey. And fourth, COVID permanently changed commuter patterns. Right now, peak hour ridership on the, the regional railroads going into New York is about a third of its 2019 pre-COVID numbers. A third. Two out of three people are not there. Some of those will come back, but I think we have seen a permanent change in ridership. People do not want to commute two hours in and two hours out if they don't have to. And last, the Long Island Railroad handles 36 peak hour trains on nine tracks, track 17 and up in the peak hour, averaging 15 minutes per train. New Jersey Transit and Amtrak right now run 26 trains in on 12 tracks. They average 28 minutes. Without widening the platforms, without even extending the platforms, you can move more trains into New York in, in, and out of New York if you improve the vertical access and you change the way people operate. So bottom line, my request to the, to the Community Board 5 Transportation Committee and to the board is ask for a thorough, equally looked at alternative that says let's maximize the improvements at Penn Station, let's not increase the footprint, let's not go south to 31st Street, but let's maximize those improvements and see what's possible. You spend less money, God knows there's not enough money to spend 35 or $40 billion on Gateway. Um, but that's the Thanks, main General. thing. An alternative that looks okay. at a full deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So, I, and, and just to just to follow up on that, in terms of the in terms of the infrastructure improvements that you are referring to, you're saying the the, the major on footprint infrastructure improvements would be lengthening uh, tracks one to four, lengthening the West End concourse, lengthening the 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 central corridor. Are there, are there major infrastructural improvements at the platform level that I'm missing? No, you're not. Um, in fact, okay. uh, you and Layla uh, did a tour. Anybody that wants to, I can walk them through the tour. Seeing is believing. But no, those are the two improvements. Yes, there are places where you could add additional stairs. If you rip off the Amtrak level and you just have the Long Island level, you can do that. But those are the two key improvements. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for that presentation. Um, uh, and, and as we've done with the other ones, um, anyone, anyone on the committee who, um, who has any follow-up questions to, um, to what we've just seen or to, or to any of the presentations that we've just seen? Those are all, uh, very enlightening and, and obviously different than, um, than what is, you know, assumed in the GPP and what are the assumed alternatives that are getting looked at by default uh, in the NEPA. EJ? Yeah, Joe. Um, I just want to emphasize if uh, the secret to getting what you want out of a NEPA process is to only put alternatives in that you can stomach and you can turn down. If you have one that doesn't, doesn't do what you want it to do, you dismiss it, you don't look at it thoroughly. And the second thing is, I want to emphasize this, the forecasts of ridership 
Right now, Eastside Access is still claiming they're going to run 30 trains into New York, um, 35 trains into Penn Station after they move 24 trains into Grand Central, Eastside Access. People need to be forced to be rational about ridership, not just future, but actually being correct about present ridership. Okay, thanks very much. Um, you know, obviously, obviously, you know, under, understand the, the realities of how the, the federal review process works. Um, hopefully we're, we're, you know, using whatever levers that we can as a community board to at least try to influence what gets included and, and bring to bear whatever pressure we can at this point. Um, using our voice to to at least pressure what that scope ends up being and what gets what gets you know very very realistically looked at. Um, uh, not oh, okay. Um, yeah, David, go ahead. No, I, I didn't mean to interrupt EJ. If you, I can no, wait. no, no. Please go. I, I, it's sort of the same question I had, uh, I, I guess, for Barry, which is, uh, you know, it's related to the question of how would we actually get this. Uh, with the proper attention paid to it and, and uh, whether the permitting process for the last alternative is, you know, grossly different than it is uh, for the other two alternatives. And, and so in some ways easier for us to weigh in on a process that includes fewer people. I'm not quite sure of the question. Uh, well, uh, it's whether the approval process for you know your proposal would be different than for Barry's or you know for the Penn South expansion. Is that a completely different approval process? Are fewer parties involved in that, or the scope of the review is is diminished so much that the issues are much narrower? Uh, the, the actual review process they go through, um, I think. They have to look at everything thoroughly. Uh, obviously, George, Barry, and I are, are all united in saying don't go south of 31st Street. Um, I'm simply saying you need to look at maximizing Penn Station without making any major changes in the platforms. Uh, I agree with, with going to Grand Central. That's a future thing, uh, but it's not a now thing. Um, and if through running works, that's a great idea. But basically, uh, um, I don't you know, it's less work if you're not looking at, at building all this new stuff. As George said, everybody gets paid the, the more expensive, the more money they make. Um, it's, it's, it's a really terrible situation. But, and I'd also, David, you actually talked about how long it takes for people to change travel patterns. The Morris and Essex line in New Jersey tripled in ridership into New York, um, tripled the, the, the travel into New York um, in about 15 years when they built Midtown Direct. It was amazingly fast. Um, and people basically either moved or switched jobs. So you can see significant changes in a relatively short period of time. But the key here, I think, is just to emphasize the money people want to spend on new infrastructure that's not needed is frightening. New York and New Jersey are in debt. They should not be spending money on things they can't do without going into debt. They should be fixing the infrastructure up. I can't emphasize that enough. Joe, while we've got you here, and, and while you're making recommendations about how to how to get things through a NEVA process, I, I'm curious what your, uh, you know, a, a review of alternatives usually has a no action alternative. What you're proposing is not necessarily stuff that would fall under the no action alternative, or would it? No, it would not. Um, and in fact, okay. George's, uh, the Grand Central, Penn, Penn Station to Grand Central, uh, is not just a two-track tunnel. You have to make improvements to Penn Station. In fact, the lower improvements, lengthening tracks one through four, is part of a, a New York to Grand Central. You have to fix up Grand Central. These are well beyond small, what they used to call transportation systems management improvements. Um, people will try to belittle them because they're not going to get the money to build a whole new thing. But no, it is not. It is not a, a, a no-build. It is an honest uh, alternative. It should be the preferred alternative. I think Barry, George, and I all agree, you shouldn't go outside the, the footprint of Penn. And it's gonna be hard okay. to, it, you know, the, 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 the real estate overhead is the driving force. Um, and I don't know how you can com combat that, but the uh, train station doesn't need that space. 
Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, Layla, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I wanted to get the uh, the opinion of uh, the panelists who spoke today uh, on uh, design built versus design bid built, and um, you know, does that change the, uh, the 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 cost or or the the driving force? I, I hear the. Uh, uh, the, the impetus to actually uh, jack up the price because then, uh, you know, the fee for the other contractors is, is higher. Just wanted to get a sense of if we do design build, does that get us a better outcome? Uh, or, you know, what, what forces are at play with one scenario versus the other? I'll just uh, say, up front, I, I apologize. We, we don't have a, a position on, I don't believe as an organization on the method of contracting, but are, are more talking about how do you optimize, assuming you can't fix the construction cost problem in New York. Um, this is Joe. I, I have an opinion on that. When you do design bill, what you do is you transfer all the risk to a bidder. It bumps the price up. It, re, it relieves the railroad, in this case, of having to talk about massive overruns. Um, and it forces some effort to do things up, up front right. But the detail involved in any of these proposals, I think, suggests that the station improvement should not be designed build. Maybe the tunnel between Penn Station and Grand Central can be designed build. But when you're talking about all this detail that really does matter, in theory at least, uh, good consultants working directly for the railroad, whichever railroad it is in, in this case, should be able to come up with a much better plan that works for the customers. Ultimately, that's the goal not to spend money. If I, if I can just have one quick follow-up, Jay. Um, currently, the, uh, the North Concourse, known as, known as the uh, Long Island Concourse, is uh, under construction and it is a design build. Do you believe that it was a judici judicious choice? I think w in the case of design build, I think they already knew what the design was. I don't think they start out with a clean sheet of paper. So the details, I think, are part of the contractor's job, but the actual scope of work and uh, the uh, basic concept, the 10% design level, I believe, were probably done in advance. Um, so if you're going to do the detail work, that's different. But I'm, I'm talking about uh, the idea of somebody coming in and saying, we're going to do, you know, the, the simple question is, does the railroad actually get to specify what the customer is going to get? Not how, how long the girders are or how thick they are, but, but where they go. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, thanks to all the panelists and, and Layla for the question. Um, I want to make sure that we give an opportunity for any uh, of the attendees from the public to speak who may want to. And then, of course, we'll go into our business session and we'll talk about what, if any, um, action to take tonight. But I'll check one more time. Are there any questions from any members of the t &E committee? Uh, great. Seeing none, um, we'll turn to members of the public who are in attendance. Uh, if you have any questions or comments um, about what we've heard or, or any alternatives that you'd like to see included, uh, please use the raise hand function now and we'll go through everyone um, who would like to speak. I am only seeing one, uh, sorry, we got two members of the public who would like to speak and we will start with Charles. Hi, um, a couple of quick things. I was wondering, um, with the through running, if, they, uh, if platforms are lengthened and um, you know, trains have uh, more cars, will other platforms along the system be able to accommodate the uh, longer trains? Uh, because I know from riding the trains in the past, sometimes there's been stations where the conductor will tell everyone they have to move to the front two cars or the front four cars because you know, the uh, station they're at, the platform's too short. So I was wondering about that. I was also wondering about um, if there could be some safety measures put into any alternatives, such as uh, the protective doors to prevent people from falling onto tracks. Maybe there could be a way that the platform could have uh, some sort of underneath that someone could 
roll from the tracks under the platform for say, you know, to get off the tracks somehow. I, I do think there is a, a problem, as we know, in the city with people being pushed onto the tracks, unfortunately. So I think that's in important. Uh, but I do think widening the platforms is very important um, because, you know, as we know, the, the system is a very old system uh, built, you know, years ago. And I, I think it, it needs to be widened to help people maneuver around stairs and, and uh, pillars like that. So um, I was wondering about things like that. And also if the other okay. two speakers are affiliated with any organizations, um, uh, it was mentioned that the first speaker was um, associated with Rethink NYC, but I wasn't too sure about the other two speakers, if they're speaking on their own or if they're affiliated with any organizations. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the questions, Charles. On the first question, you know, my understanding is that in terms of in terms of trains being lengthened, um, you know, what we heard tonight was was you know uh, a mention of lengthening tracks one to four, which would which would make tracks one to four as long as the rest of the tracks already at Penn Station. So, um, I, you know, I don't think we're talking about introducing longer train. Uh, 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 longer trains to the system than what it already runs. But, you know, of course, any of the panelists can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, you know, the, the, the other notion, you know, in terms of widening the platforms is, uh, as you mentioned at the end there, to assist with uh, uh, loading and unloading and safe and creating safer platforms that are not as congested and crowded um, and that can load and unload at the same time and more safely. But um, I don't believe we're talking at any point or in any of these proposals about introducing uh, longer trains. Um, uh, uh, as to as to letting the um, and, and perhaps I should have called for this more explicitly. Um, to the to the second and third presenters, uh, George and Joe. I don't know. Do you have any affiliation that you want to um, uh, point to, or do you just want? Or are you speaking in your own capacity? Maybe George first. Okay. Well, uh, you hear me there. Uh, yep. I I'm speaking on behalf of our organization, the Institute for Rational Urban Mobility which was formed after the, uh, uh, to, to create a, a holding tank for uh, ideas. And uh, uh, we had an exhibit about making the connection, which was held at the Municipal Arts Society uh, about 10 years ago, maybe uh, some many have seen it. We've, we've had a, a longstanding interrelationship with other organizations, regional plan and, and so forth, but we are an independent uh, entity ourselves, nine member board. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, Joe, do you have any affiliation? Or are you uh, speaking in your own capacity? Uh, just me, myself and I. Um, and uh, okay. I, I just wanna comment on the, the platform door issue. If there's not a problem, you really don't need to spend a lot of money to fix it. I am unaware except for a couple of drunks over time, where people have uh, been pushed off platforms at Penn Station. The Long Island Railroad um, brings a train in with people on the platform. Uh, and the train come in, comes in slowly, engineer comes in slowly. And so the actual people are standing on the platform, the train comes in, anyone could fall off the platform, but, but it doesn't happen. Um, I, I don't think there's a need uh, it changes dramatically if you're building something brand new with new stations, but not where you're um, just fixing up what basically is 110 years old. Okay, thanks for addressing that, Joe. Um, Charles, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for the questions and the comments. I think we, I think we addressed all of them. Um, you know, if not. Uh, cool. Um, the, uh, the other person who had their hand raised, uh, is T. Lawrence Wheatman. Hi, thank you so much. I, I just want to, um, put out that, uh, you know, Pennsylvania station is called Pennsylvania station. Um, but it has not been a station since the mid sixties. That's when it got turned into a two-sided terminal. Um, so indeed, um, through running was of course, part of the, the original design and the way it worked before 
the 1960s. Um, so the idea of you know turning it into a, a through running station just is uh, to me it just boggles my mind that we have to talk about it so much because I understand that you know, now they uh, the modern tracks etc cetera, etc cetera, but you know putting on the tongue so as to make it possible to um, uh, to have the trains that have the uh, another system of locomotion uh, that goes in there uh, no, another uh, uh, item I know that um, uh, the, uh, an option to have a deeper cavern has been one that's been talked about and that the major problem I believe with that was that uh, the uh, trains don't have the capability to make the grade uh, that uh, would be too stu stu steep of a grade. Uh, and perhaps this is, option is uh, too expensive to think of, but since we talked about uh, upgrading trains so that they could actually now run through this station um, with a minimal upgrade, it would seem to me that, you know, perhaps putting in a lower gear so that they could make the grade to, to make it a more efficient way of doing that. Um, uh, just throwing that out as a possibility. I have no clue if, uh, if that has uh, any real, uh, uh, foundation in reality. And uh, another one is that I, uh, uh, I first learned, first got interested in this when um, it was certainly pre-2016, maybe even 2014. And one of the presentations I saw, first of all, they, all the presentations back then included uh, when uh, Madison Square Garden left because lo and behold, of course, you, I'm sure you know that Madison Square Garden had a 50 year lease. It expired uh, approximately ten, almost 10 years ago. Uh, the lease was renewed uh, with the understanding that they would be looking for a place to move to when this lease was over. Um, and one of those uh, possibilities was actually the cheapest, uh, probably, of all of them, which was that once Madison Square Garden moved, um, the, the shell of Madison Square Garden would be maintained. In other words, the uh, taking out most of the supports that support the arena, but then leaving an empty shell that uh, where the outside walls are turned into glass, uh, so that when people get out of the train, they are seeing New York City above them. Uh, and apparently there's advantages, was advantages to that. I mean, I, I'm just mentioning this because nobody else uh, uh, hasn't come up. Uh, it, that one at the time just seemed so brilliant just because first of all, it was an incredibly beautiful idea, I thought, uh, a very simple idea. I mean, I love the idea of rebuilding the original station as well, but that's, uh, uh, I, I think that you know, a lot of people can think that that's so waste or, or something. Uh, but here we have an idea that, uh, oh, right, uh, uh, that an advantage to that, uh, that turning it into the, 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 the uh, a round station that, that is already there, essentially, uh, um, that has an advantage that, that, uh, for um, what they call it, climate control. Um, because as a um, as a greenhouse <laughs> has excellent climate control, you close windows to warm it up in the winter, and you open windows to cool it off in the summer. <laughs> yep. I'll stop there. I have, I have plenty more I could say. Then. Oh well, no. I mean, thanks for the thanks for the comment. I mean, you, you know, we, we, the um, the final the final proposal you were referring to. Um, Vishan Chakrabarty proposed, uh, uh, presented, presented that concept um, to Community Board 5 a couple of years ago alongside a, a proposal for, for relocating the garden. But yeah, there were, um, there were some nice advantages uh, to reusing the superstructure like that, including, I think, um, uh, much faster egress and wayfinding. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously, obviously, you know, uh, this after uh, you know this evening, uh, the committee will be mostly focused on on you know below ground improvement and what we believe should be should be evaluated out of that. But you know, um, much appreciated, uh, um, uh, Lawrence, for the comment. Thank you. Um, so I, sorry, I see uh, I see Joe's hand up but you should uh, still be able to, to speak and I don't know if you had a comment um, but uh, at any rate um, thank you uh, thank you thank you for all the commenters and for um, and to all the the uh, presenters who brought who brought presentations tonight um, incredibly helpful to see um, different alternatives um, I believe uh, with that we'll we'll take it into our uh, business session um, where only the committee members uh, will speak at this point about what, if any, action um, to to take tonight. And 
you know, unless there are, unless there are major objections to, to uh, a particular course of action, you know, what it seems, you know, as I said, that without committing ourselves really to any particular course, it seems to me like what we're in a position here to do is to have, hopefully, as some of the presenters mentioned, hopefully to have some kind of maximum influence on um, uh, uh, what, what may be evaluated as part of this NEPA review. And I think, you know, maybe what, what we're faced with here is how to structure our request slash recommendation slash demand. Um, as, as hearing these different proposals and, and, you know, and knowing what we have learned from the GPP process over the last year and a half, which believe me was, was many, many hours of meetings that um, uh, myself, Vicki Barbero and Layla um, and, and Clayton participated in, uh, you know, uh, as the, as the representatives from CB5 um, for, you know, what, what we've, what we've learned is that certainly alternatives will be analyzed um, as part of that. You know, to 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 the point that the uh, one of our panelists, Joe, made early, uh, earlier this evening. Uh, you know, you, you never know exactly whether they're being analyzed in a pro forma sort of fashion in in one of those um, uh, EISs, or whether that uh, there's been a there's been a very serious uh, look taken at it. And I think that's something that we need to. That we need to push for here using our voice. Um, uh, uh, simply trying to break down some of the things that we've heard tonight, and and based on what I know from you know that litany of of meetings and predictions that we've heard through the GPP process, it does seem like a foregone conclusion that the that you know the default situation is that the NEPA review will contain, as they all do, a no action scenario. Uh, the state's preferred southern expansion. And probably the two most basic, basic but, but equally in expensive alternatives, which are um, a deep cavern alternative like Eastside Access and a northern station, which is frequently mentioned and which was part of the, the ARC um, review in the past. I mean, you know, I certainly no one is as far as I can tell, advocating either of those two latter ones, but they are frequently mentioned as likely alternatives to be analyzed. So, you know, we can, we can acknowledge that we, Southern expansion will certainly be involved. No action will certainly be involved. Deep cut and Northern expansion, even though no one's asking for them, will, will probably be involved. And it seems to me like the others that we want to make sure are are probably involved um, are most definitely through running, which I actually think there's a good chance that um, uh, you know they will either you know want to rigorously evaluate or at least evaluate enough to <laughs> dismiss it as an alternative. Um, so it seems to me very likely that we should push for through running with both existing platforms and the widening of the platforms. Um, you know I think we've heard tonight that that you can do some more with um with through running through existing platforms and that you really get a lot of a lot more of the benefit when widening the platforms. Um, so so I think you know one thing to make sure that we are calling for to be added is through running with those two um with those two different flavors with those two different variables. Uh, we also heard tonight about um you know from one of the presenters from from Joe Clift about the about this this his desire for a, and I'm just sort of trying to summarize what we heard tonight, his desire for a, for a, um, you know, Penn Station to the max style improvements, uh, which, which we listed as lengthening tracks one to four to make them the same length as the other tracks, widening the west, uh, lengthening the west end concourse so that it can access um, uh, all the tracks and lengthening the central corridor um, uh, so that it can access all the, all the tracks. Uh, along with along with another number of other station improvements, like perhaps more more stairs, but um, but that you know in inside the existing footprint alternative was what uh, Joe um, called for being analyzed as its own alternative, which is which is you know logical. Um, and then finally, you know we we heard about you know uh, through running in conjunction with late lengthening the tracks in conjunction with that Grand Central Tunnel. Um, it was 
you know, uh, there are different ways to think of that in combination with some of these other alternatives. But um, it seemed to me from a number of the panelists that uh, that that a number of our panelists tonight would probably push for it to be analyzed as its own alternative, um, you know, in conjunction with something like lengthening tracks one to four, but perhaps not not just as as being um, packaged in with uh, one of the other two that I mentioned. That's that's my take on what we heard and and one potential way to organize it. But I'm very curious to hear from other members of the committee and also to get a sense from folks as to what um, you know, and, and, and to, to Layla as well, who is being generous with her time tonight joining this conversation um, as, as chair of other committees on Community Board 5, uh, who's familiar with the process, what, what folks think might be most effective. Um, so I'd love to hear comments and thoughts, and we'll start with David, who has his hand up. Uh, thanks. I guess my one concern is that we're not a technical body. So if, if we just kind of jump into the fray here and say, here are some technical alternatives and we believe, or the people that have presented them to us believe that they're less expensive. If that's the end of the discussion, then I think a lot of the issues that were raised by the speakers about the you know, sort of bureaucratic response to that is probably gonna to be to shred them to pieces <laughs> over the course of the process. So we, we might get them into the process, but we don't know what happens during the process. Um, it, I mean, it sounds like the system in some ways is built against some of these alternatives. I mean, I guess the question from our side as, as more of a political body is whether we can combine the two pieces of this thing, the you know, kind of above grade density issue and the, if you will, below grade uh, expansion issue uh, and say, look, we would we would support um, a, a somewhat reduced density above grade, but if you look at these alternatives that cost significantly less, then you're, then the state and the city could actually be coming way ahead uh, from an expense standpoint, from an exposure under the bonds. I mean, I, I read the city planning letter uh, about um, the mayor's concern about what you know guaranteeing these bonds means um and so all those issues would come into play rather than just the technical issues of you know do we extend the concourse or you know what what have you uh and so we'd be saying you know we'll support x square feet we urge you know these alternatives to be looked at and if you do the same math that was done on the 30 billion dollar proposal that's currently uh, being reviewed, then the guarantee issues to the city are way less, city and state come out way ahead economically. And it just seems like a much more reasonable approach to the whole problem. And we're no longer just a technical uh, review, um, you know, leading into, into whatever it is, NEPA or EIS. Yeah, thanks, David. And and I'll just respond to that by by clarifying a couple points that I probably should have clarified in my in my framing there a second ago. Um, I do think it behooves us to reiterate what we have said um, in the past, even even in our last um, official position where we rejected the GPP, which is to reiterate some of the stuff that you just said that um, we support the need for capacity expansion at Penn Station and that we're frankly supportive of increased density in the area that we're that this none of this was meant to be a blanket rejection of financial feasibility um uh or or kind of the need for development both below ground and above ground um you know i i'll i'll perhaps defer to our resident land use Guru Layla, as to whether we want to assign numbers to that and whether that helps us politically in our statement or not, <laughs> to, to, to say what amount of density we would be willing to accept. I'm not, she may have a sense of whether or not that is an, an advantageous thing to put into a resolution. I think we definitely want to say that we are in support of both, uh, we are supportive of both those goals. The one thing I would say, David, is that um, I don't know that it, um, uh, you mentioned, um, lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, 
Yep. Sorry. Lost the point. Uh, Layla, did you have a, um, did you have any thought on, on whether or not to put a, put a stake in the ground uh, when it comes to how much density we would want to support? Oh, I, I think in relation to that, what, what, uh, sorry, I remembered my point, David, the, what we had said in the, in our prior statements in our prior official statements was that we, um, uh, we basically thought that instead of double barreling these things by saying how much density we would adopt at the same time while trying to figure out what it pays for, that we basically thought the process should be that we figure out the ideal alternative first, and then from there figure out what it means for development and how to pay for it and how to build it. I don't know if at this point it would make sense to kind of go back on, on our call for that order of operations. But um, Layla has her hand raised and I sort of had a question to her and she also has a comment. So um, uh, right. Layla, let's, go for let's, it. Let's bundle it all together. Um, so, you know, the, the, the first thing that we have to say is that those proposals are entirely segmented and not by us, but, you know, the state decided to do it this way. So we have a GPP, which is a you know, land use real estate uh, project that is uh, moving on its own track. Uh, we've lamented that. We've told that we've been told that you know it is the way it is, and that that is not going to change. So now here at the uh, transportation committee, we're dealing with transportation matters, and uh, on a technical standpoint, it is really important that we shape the discussion so that the scope of the proposal is actually the correct scope. We wouldn't want to be in a situation where the producers of this environmental review uh, study, which most likely will be uh, NEPA, so undertaken by a federal agency, would basically tell us, okay, so we're going to study the southern expansion, but we decide that uh, the track expansion of, uh, you know, that serves the New Jersey transit existing tracks is not within scope. We don't want them to say, we're not going to study a connector between Penn Station and Gwen uh, Terminal because this is not in scope. So we basically want to shape that before even the scoping document comes out. Because what we have found is that once the scoping document comes out, there is a scoping session, but in order to change the scope, it is almost impossible. So yes, there is a review, but this review does not produce the results that we need. And what we need to do right here, right now, is to basically say, this is the scope of the environmental review we want you guys to conduct. We wanna know how practical, feasible, and cost-effective it is to lengthen the tracks through run, by creating, you know, catenary and third rail and, you know, all this technical stuff that we are not experts in. And we need to figure out how much it's co it costs and where it would go. I think that in an ideal world, what we would want is first to start with purpose. The purpose of the train station is to move people. To give you an order of, of scale, uh, Paris moves 3 million people per day and New York area, including New Jersey and Long Island, moves 1 million people per day. It's not okay. We need to do better. We need to move more people. Why is Paris able to move more people? Because most of the uh, train system is interconnected and through runs through Paris and basically connects the entire region um, rather than, you know, having everything budding into uh, a Paris terminal. So I think what is important in uh, the, the work that we're doing right now, uh, in based on the information we've heard from uh, the, the, the panelists who gave uh, great presentations, is to actually take that and say, well, we don't know if it has to be, you know, expanded tracks, if, you know, the track needs to be lengthened, we don't have the definitive answer. We should not have the definitive answer, but we want the person who is in charge of the environmental review that is upcoming to take all of that into account and to analyze it. And hopefully we will see that this becomes the preferred alternative because it will be more effective in terms of moving people and more effective in terms of spending our dollars. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that would be an ideal thing so that we shape the narrative and we shape the outcome of the scoping before it gets produced. 
Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Layla. I'm taking notes here and I'll try to summarize kind of, I think where we're at um, when we get to that point. I have. Um, a, yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead, George. Yeah, I was going to say I strongly am saddened that this committee uh, has, has categorically uh, dismissed the Penn Station Grand Central connection. Even uh, Layla has described the uh, multiple station connections in Paris. We talked about London, uh, uh, the S-Bahn, et cetera. Why are we categorically excluding this as an option? Because it does in fact you know, deal with a lot of the issues we're trying to uh, solve. Are we- yeah, I, I, I don't think we are. I don't think we are, George. I have it. I have it in my notes as one of the as one of the major alternatives that I think it's worth um, asking to be included. And I think I think Layla's point was that, you know, that the the scope of the EIS, you know, the, the biggest fear of the scope is that they end up telling us it should only be it should only talk about things within this box. I don't want to speak for Layla, but, you know, it sounds like Layla was try basically trying to say that the network effects of regionally running and what, what you build inside the box and how it affects the rest of the region really needs to be within the scope of the NEPA review. So I think it sounds like, it sounded to me at least like Layla was saying that, that we, first off, we need to define the scope of the NEPA review as being beyond just a three block square and that the alternatives that are assessed need to be all need to be assessed relative to the effects that they have on the entire region and i do think it makes sense for us to say that one of those alternatives is you know not just what happens to the station but you know any new connections that can enable the station to run more efficiently and it, and you know i i I have in my notes here that that one of the three major alternatives that we should argue for adding in is the Grand Central connector. Thank you. That would make me feel a little better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to make it sound like it was, it was being both, dismissed. I just. Yep. They're both <laughs> located in Community Board Five's district. The Grand true. Central is a magnificent terminal be a great place to arrive if you're coming from New Jersey. The only thing that's missing is a track connection between the two stations. You can actually use the terminals then of course use the bathrooms and whatever else, but basically uh, to, to ignore Grand Central as part of this of a family of options is really and specifically excluded, can really then say, look, board five doesn't want to have Grand Central included. Now, George, I, th I think we're saying the same thing that, you know, that's exactly my point. We need to be all encompassing and we need to make sure that all of these options are within scope. We don't want to be in a situation where we'd be told it is not within scope. So we need to avoid that. So we are in agreement. We want the connector to be evaluated. We want through running to be evaluated. We want track widening to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. We want catenary to third rail to be evaluated on all fronts, both in terms of uh, practicality, in terms of cost, in terms of impact to the built environment. And the other thing I would say, EJ, if, if you allow me, is that you know, for us, what matters also is preserving our uh, our uh, built environment. You know, the 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 uh, the, the the damage uh, that the expansion would cause to our district and the demolition of six city, city blocks. And, uh, you know, in, in the specific instance of, uh, you know, the, the expansion, the demolition of, you know, a block and, and a half, even more, it, through eminent domain is simply not acceptable. Um, so it is really imperative that we push very hard to, uh, you know, get the, uh, the, the federal agency to give a, hard and deep look at uh, through running. And, you know, the thing I would say is that, you know, I came from a perspective of not really understanding through running. It is kind of counterintuitive. And now that I understand it, it is so clear that it is the only option to really move people faster and more efficiently and allow for the growth that the region needs. Thank you, Leila. Yep. 
Yeah, thanks. So, I, you know, as as I as I hear these comments and sort of craft craft out a statement that we could start to adopt, here's what it's starting to look like to me. Um, an introduction where we where we you know I identify the relationship of where we are now with the GPP, as as Layla talked about, reiterate our support of goals of expanding capacity, reiterate our our you know in, in some way reiterate our support of of you know transit oriented development and um, and uh, you know the idea that density around a transit is a good idea. Um, and that we're not opposed to that kind of development, you know, and, and A, to support those principles. And then two major, I feel like sections of a resolution. One that helps to, that, that helps to set the scope, uh, the, the, what, we, what we think needs to be the scope um, topically of the NEPA review where we're laying out not alternatives, but the categories so that, um, so that the alternatives that, that we want to address in, in say a second half um, are deemed in scope so that, so that their effects on the neighborhood and on other transit hubs and on the entire region is deemed within scope of analyzing those, um, those alternatives and they can't be called outside of scope. And I think that would be, that would talk about defining, you know, categories of, of effects and, and um, infrastructure that we feel like should be in scope, including Length of length of uh, platforms, including width of platforms, including effects on train stock and through running and regional rail cooperation, and and costs and how many people are being moved and and compatibility of train stock across region, et cetera. We want to define all of those different categories as being within scope. Um, you know, similarly as as Layla said, uh, you know, defining the purpose of a train station and and that. Each alternative should be analyzed in that context. How many people is it moving? And, and the effects of the different alternatives on build environment. We're defining, you know, essentially a matrix here. The first half of, of our resolution can be referring to the different categories in which we think it's worthy of analyzing different alternatives. And then finally, once, once defining that scope in the way that Layla was talking about, the second half of our of our resolution can talk about specific alternatives now based on the scope that we defined in the first half that really definitely should be in scope. <laughs> um, uh, saying that we that through running, you know, we can expand on exactly the different flavors of it, that through running should be rigorously examined, that improvements within the existing footprint as a standalone option should be rigorously examined, and that a grand central connector tunnel with its constituent, um, you know, necessary uh, improvements, you know, in the station that it would need as well, be be rigorously examined. That is that is where I feel like what I feel like we're building in terms of a, um, a statement. Sorry to go long winded on it, but you know that's 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 I, I think a a um, a resolution that we might be circling in towards. Any any additional thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, David. Oh, well, maybe it's just a both and. I mean, I don't think anything I was saying, you know, stands in the way of what we've described. But I I think we pick up support from other places if we say there's then if we don't want to be specific about density, that these plans create less pressure for density that they reduce the risk to the city of double barreling the, the bonds that have to be issued, that they're more uh, fiscally responsible for the state. So, you know, it, instead of leaving it to people to just try and understand what these technical solutions are and their lower cost, we sort of get to the end of the discussion, which is the economics of it and the risks to the public parties are, are dramatically reduced. And I, and I think we can talk about that as well, that there are, that there are economic and, and community and benefits to the city to you rigorously evaluating these alternatives um, that frankly, the, the city and the state should love. They should want to see these, they should want to see these evaluated. I think that's totally worthy of inclusion. Yes. Uh, BJ. Yeah, um, I completely support what you outlined, EJ, and recapping the 
um, the new statements. Um, as a former Long Island Railroad writer, I can attest to the fact that it does get jam packed. And there were times when we were crushed trying to go down the steps of, particularly at track 17, 20, 19, 18, all of them, right? On that Port Washington or on Conkerman line. Currently, you know, and I still ride the Long Island Railroad to visit my family in Long Island. And, you know, it's, it's a very different because the front side by 7th Avenue and 32nd Street, because they're still under construction, it is just nasty there with the homeless people and the different shops and that that's not there. But on the Monaghan train station side by the new station, it's beautiful, but it still needs work. My question and comment is because MTA just announced that they're going to explore looking at putting up uh, those, I guess, guardrails or those doors at three major subway stations, how it's going to impact the cost to this, right? The budget, because that's a multi-million dollar project, putting up those doors in light of the recent subway, you know, pushings and people dying, unfortunately. And then the second question is, um, you know, as Leila mentioned, it's so disruptive, this construction and all this, it's already going on now on, on 7th Avenue and there's constant subway um, upgrades and train rides. And I just wonder about the timeline for all of these uh, new uh, proposals. So in terms of like, how long are we gonna live with this? And we're looking at Midtown West is so depressed now and, and with COVID we're so affected. So uh, that's just a commentary saying, you know, timeline wise and the immediate areas that it's gonna impact Koreatown down to, you know, uh, and, and the subways. Cause there's, you know, MTA is also doing a major project to revitalize a lot of that area. So. That was my comment. Thank you. Okay, thanks, PJ. Um, you, you know, on the um, on the doors, and yeah, w w there was a there was a question from a member of the public on something similar there. Um, they sound, or, or in in true MTA fashion, the three state the three subway stations that they want to build it in, they seem to be doing it in the most expensive way possible. If it's going to take a hundred million dollars to build three doors. Um, but, uh, when we addressed that earlier today, you know, I, I think th there was a, there was a comment, uh, from, uh, one of the panelists, Joe, that, that, um, it doesn't currently seem to be a problem in, in the train station. And, and it, those, those are certainly so far have not been mentioned, at least when I've been, uh, aware of. Um, as as something slated for Penn Station. That having been said, you know these these things, these plans that haven't been designed yet and certainly haven't been priced yet. Who knows if exactly something like that would be built into it? Um, I do think it's worthwhile to perhaps add to our criteria, kind of what I said, w w maybe should be the first half of what is evaluated within the scope of all the different alternatives, um, is to is to indicate that we think that, to your point, cost of any amenities like like the doors and time to build, which by which I mean kind of the timeline, uh, should be evaluated for all the alternatives. You know, if one of them, you know, if uh, I'm making this up, but if one alternative is easily built in five years and another one, you know, takes 30 years before true through running is, is, is available and helping people get to the long, to Long Island faster. You know, I think that is, um, I think that is something that should, uh, you know, absolutely be evaluated when, when weighing these alternatives against each other. I think that's a great point. And I think we should add that to our, to our notion of what scope is. Thanks, CJ. And just as a clarification, I meant like with the recent MT announcement, they're going to refocus budget on that and how it's going to impact these proposals. Not that we got should it, have railroads and train stations in Long Island Railroad because they are yeah, safe. Yeah, yeah. Them for, but yeah. Yep, and I and I think that goes to cost. I think that goes to how much how much money they're able to sink into this versus what they're doing on the subway and how much it would actually cost to do anything like that in future. You know, if it becomes a standard that needs to be applied to future train stations as well. So I think including cost in our in our notion of scope, which you know I'm sure it is, but I but I think we want to make sure that those different elements of cost are are included. Uh, yeah, comment from Janice. Yeah, so along the same lines, I was wondering if you know going back to something that Joe said was uh, questioning the assumption of how many commuters would be going through these stations. If um, you know, in addition to like time and price, if looking at that and um, essentially making sure that that's properly analyzed um, 
since I can see that factoring into what alternative like might be able to, um, you know, accommodate whatever they're projecting going into the future. Yeah, I, I, I think that that makes total sense. Layla, Layla referred to something similar as well when she talked about, you know, what is the purpose of a train station? You know, ultimately it's moving people and how many people are each of these alternatives moving? Um, you know, I, I'm fairly confident that that's the kind of thing that they're inclined to definitely look at, you know, um, when evaluating alternatives as well. We should definitely mention it, um, you know, uh, alongside all of the other ways that we want to make sure the scope is wider than just how many people go through a train station in a day. It should refer to like, okay, how many people are you, how many people are you taking from New Jersey to Long Island on a given day? It should, it should think about regional effects and, and those different types of things as well. So we should have a broad definition of people moving, you know, what, what is, how many people are you moving with this particular alternative? I think that is, I think that's a great point. And I think to, to your point and Layla's, we should, we should come up with a broad definition of, of how many people are being moved. We can definitely include that. Uh, yeah, BJ. Yeah, just one more, um, just out of curiosity, is there any, um, more, can we double our impact of what we want to request by joining with Community Board 4 and, and putting a resolution together? I don't know if that's been done before or what the procedure wise is, but maybe when we're saying both Community 4 and Community 5 is impacted this way, maybe there is a, a better, like there's a force when we double up, I guess, or, or, or power in numbers, for lack of better words. Yes. As Community Board 4. Community Board 4 passed a similar statement to this last month. And part of the reason why we wanted to have this discussion this month is so that we can adopt our own statement. You know, they're not going to be word for word identical. They might even have, you know, some different priorities and some different um, uh, ideas in them. But, you know, where we are aligned, we can point that out. We can, we can you know, create a unified front. We do this with, you know, our neighbor community boards very frequently. You know, the Penn Station... GPP overlaps, particularly CB4 and CB5. And part of the impetus for, for adopting a position like this right now and on this month um, was to, to present a position in lockstep with what CB4 adopted last month so that where we are calling for the same things, you know, um, CB4 in particular um, endorsed, endorsed certain approaches like through running you know, where we're in, where we're in alignment with CB4, um, you know, it, it makes a much, it makes that much of a stronger statement that, oh, the communities are united in calling specifically for this alternative or for these alternatives um, to be included. And yeah, as you just said, hopefully it has um, an amplifying effect in terms of making our voice heard and actually getting it taken seriously in the, um, in the NEPA review. We're, we're, we're also always in communication with our counterparts in CB4 for those reasons. Thanks. Um, any, other, any other comments or, 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 or objections to sort of leaning in, the, in this direction of what um, we've been outlining for a resolution? I won't, I won't repeat everything, but, you know, I think, I think we have a structure that sounds like we're addressing um, almost any, almost everything that's been brought up by the committee and, and being inclusive of kind of all the viewpoints that we've been talking about. Uh, if there are no, if there are no other comments, um, might there be any kind of motion on the resolution as so outlined? So moved. Thank you, Maki. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Joel. Um, uh, there's been a motion and a second to um, to vote on a resolution. You know, uh, as outlined, um, identifying you know our our our, uh, our general goals for Penn Station are um, what we specifically believe should be included in the criteria of scope for any NEPA review of expansion of Penn Station. And specifically that we believe the, um, the three alternatives that we 
outlined um, should be included among other alternatives assessed uh, as, as part of the um, uh, NEPA review. Those three alternatives being through running, maximizing improvements within the existing footprint and a tunnel, uh, a Grand Central terminal connector uh, with Penn Station. And then finally, um, uh, uh, some points that these plans uh, that including these alternatives can actually be to the benefit to the economic um, and community benefit of both the city and the state. Um, so with the motion and a second, we will uh, take a vote on that. Uh, we'll take that resolution um, to a vote. Uh, starting with uh, Zach. Yes. Uh, Fortunato. Fortunato. I will come back. Um, Sarah. I believe we lost Sarah. Uh, Nancy. I guess we lost Nancy. Uh, Maki. Yes. David. Yes. Noah. Lost Noah. BJ. Yes. Pete. Yes. Ryan. Lost Ryan. Janice. Yes. George. Yes. Joel. Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Fortunato. Uh, let me tell us up and make sure one, two. Okay, I'll check with Fort Fortunato one more time. Are you, are, are you here with us? Are you able to vote? Okay, that's 10 yeses. Um, and we have, uh, Vicki, you unmuted, but uh, we cannot hear you. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. We do have 10 yeses, um, which does constitute a quorum of the, um, of, of the transportation committee. So I think we're in good shape. Uh, anyway, um, with that, uh, my, thanks to, my thanks to all the presenters today. My thanks to um, uh, everyone who commented as part of the process and my thanks to the committee. Um, uh, much appreciate um, your your cooperation on this, and uh, and uh, I think this will be uh, you know I think this is a really good discussion to have that that kind of we initiated on our own because it seemed like a good time to weigh into this process, and you know we'll obviously continue to participate in all the different um, jurisdictional reviews that are that are going on, um, and and keep you updated as to what happens. But um, great discussion as always. So thank you to all. Uh, I believe that concludes our committee meeting this evening.